you, Brother Jim. Let's remain standing just a moment now for prayer. Let's bow our heads. Is there any spoken request? If you'd be known by an uplifted hand, just to God, say, I, I hold in your mind now what you, what you want to ask Him, and believe it with all your heart while I offer my prayer for you too. Heavenly Father, we are count this such a privilege to come to the house of the Lord upon this gloomy day and, and find the sunlight of God shining. You hear the Holy Spirit uh, singing through the people and speaking through the people, just a, a little cluster of sunshine within. We thank Thee for this, the heavenly sunshine around our hearts, how we thank Thee for it. Now there, Thy people has just lifted their hands in this congregation that they have requests uh, that they would desire that you would answer them this morning. I pray, Father, that you'll grant each of their requests. There are so many piled up on the desk and so many uh, requests everywhere, people sick, suffering, phone call, long distance, about 50 a day. Oh, God, what shall we do? Just lead us, Lord. We, we don't know which way to go or what to do, but th thou can direct these things. And we pray that you'll grant it to us because it's, it's our intention, Lord, what life that we have on earth is given to us by thee, and we want to use it to honor thee by. Now, you guide us in those things, Father. Bless us today as we've assembled together to hear the word of the Lord, to sing the songs, to offer prayer. Hear our prayers. Joy with us in our songs and speak to us through the word. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. I just don't know any place that I would deem uh, to be a greater privilege to stand than it would be to stand in the, in the pulpit, to break the bread of life to waiting, hungry, thirsting people. And this is a great privilege. First, I'd like to ask if, if any of the Wright family is your Hattie or Arbel or any Hattie. Is Arvel with you, Hattie? Uh, to ask him if he'd come by the house immediately, if what I told him, you know, for, uh, drop by the house. If we can, I forgot to bring it down with me this morning, something for the little doggie they got down there. So I'm, uh, just, if you will, just drive right by the house as you leave out for, for your sur uh, after service. And now, Edith, uh, Hattie's sister, that we know is the little girl that's been crippled up since she was a, a baby. And she's a woman now. And she's in very bad shape. Now, uh, the, about a year ago, I went down there when she had her first spell. And immediately, I found what her trouble was by the help and grace of God. Now, really, what's the trouble with the child? She's setting her limbs hip together and she can't even move them apart. It's because of the tremendous pressure on um, the, the nerve system. But what it is, there's nothing physically wrong with the child outside of the affliction of infantile prowess when she was about six months old. She screamed and cried all of her life nearly till we prayed for her many years ago, and, and she's been happy ever since until about a year ago. And now it's really menopause. In other words, the changing of her life. And her nerves are in such a tremendous condition and the little lady has got on her mind that she's dying. She, she's just not going to live just from one hour to the other. And you know, healthy, strong women have terrible times. Sometimes have to take shots of hormone and, and go into the institutions and take shock treatments and everything during that time. The human being has two changes of life. You have the change from a boy to a, a, a man, from a woman, from a girl to a woman. About 16, 17 years old, they get like a bunch of just flybonites. And, and uh, if you can just suffer with them during that age, I got a daughter in that age right now, Rebecca. Pray for her. And uh, Billy, all, every one of us, we come through that little frantic age. And, uh, and so we must suffer with them, realizing it's something that, that they, they have to go through. Now, Edith, that this changing of, of, the, of the seven years, every seven years your life changes, so the seven times seven, you see, it, and it makes it kind of hard. And that's a complete change, and it, it bothers the women. Man usually get uh, kind of a funny carrying on during that time, and, 
sometimes leave their wives, but women are, are unfertile after that. And we all go through that, and we must remember that it's things that we must bear with one another and understand those things. And little Edith has gotten this condition, and she's lost much weight, and she looks bad. And, and I'll tell you, uh, some night, not all of you together, but just a little trip down. They set up with her day and night. And a, a little trip down there from this tabernacle and, and the different tabernacles, the, the sister tabernacles here. Some of you people go down and see the right family. I'm sure they'd appreciate it. Just go down, sit with them a little while, and talk to them, shake their hand, and have no more than a little friendly visit. We, we forget that so easy, you know. And when it comes to our own home, then we appreciate it, and we must remember others appreciate it too. And uh, the right family, I'm sure, would appreciate that. I, I know you would have done it if you know this condition existed, but you didn't know it. So there, therefore, uh, I was telling you this morning for it. Re go and visit the right family. And try to cheer Edith up. Don't, don't tell her she looks bad. Tell her she looks good. She go be fine. Well, she'll be all right if we just keep holding on for her. That's what we're here for. She's our sister. And, and we're here to hold on in these times for that child. It's like I want somebody to hold for me and pray while I was uh, going through my trials. And you want somebody for yours. And, and the right family has been a, a long, one of the oldest members that comes to this gathering. Them, I guess, and Brother Roy Slaughter and Sister Slaughter. I seen them just a few moments ago, waved at them when they come in. Thought myself as I drove around the corner, how many years have I seen Brother and Sister Slaughter take their place in this church? through the ups and downs and still waving on. Then the right family, and like that, you appreciate those people, you see. And let's, let's show our appreciations to them. Now, uh, the, today I got a long message. It's uh, on an indictment. And, uh, and then tonight I hear these communion and uh, foot wash and so forth. So the pastor will speak and we'll, have, we'll come down. And if, you, if you're around, come and enjoy the, the message from the pastor, from the Lord. And then also from uh, the foot washing and the, and the communion tonight, it's be a, a real heavy packed night. So we'd be glad to have you if you have no other place to go. And we want to appreciate Don Ruddle and, um, and our brother and Brother Jackson and, and these brethren, our, our brother or sister churches that's uh, associated, Brother Jack Palmer over here who keeps the, the group down in Georgia. And we, we, we want to appreciate these men with all of our heart. For times when we have services, when I come in, and uh, they, they come to visit us, and we appreciate it. I see this morning my good friend, uh, Dr. Lee Vale and his wife. I recognized Sister Vale there first, and I kept looking around to see where Brother Lee was. And uh, I got a, a, what the old Southern expression, a crow to pick with him, see? Whenever I got, I looked for him every day at that convention. They'd be down there to help me out. I said, well, if Lee comes, have him preach, and I'll just make prayer for the sick. And we paged him and everything else and never could find him. So uh, um, um, I got a, the crow to pick with him when I <laughs> get to talk. And uh, we're glad to have Brother and Sister Vale in this morning. And maybe there's many more here that we don't understand. I see a sister here, I believe, from Chicago. I, can't, I know the group here, but I just can't call their names exactly, so we, we appreciate it from everywhere, wherever you are. I see the brethren here, two young fellows is to be ordained, young in the ministry at least, this morning, to uh, our colored brethren from up in New York has just received their credentials through the Philadelphian church and uh, given this church as where they come from, and we're going to lay hands upon them that God will bless their ministry in New York. We got two or three little churches up there, I believe. Brother Delano has uh, one of the little groups there, and we are we appreciate them. And, and here's two more going out now to make uh, have services for the people there, and we we appreciate these things. The Lord bless you richly. So many, I look around, see different ones that you just can't call all their names, but I know that He understands. Now, I believe if our sister, the pianist, or one of them will come here and play for us when the coal of fire had touched the prophet, making him as pure as pure can be. And when the word of voice of God said, Who will go for us? Then he answered, Here am I, send me. When we ordain these ministers by laying on of hands. Now, we realize that the scriptural way of ordaining a minister is laying on of hands. I think that's where our latter rain brethren are the uh, battle for people and so forth got mixed up. And when you've seen that, laying on of hands to impart spiritual gifts. 
Now, we do not believe that gifts comes by laying on of hands. We believe that a laying on of hands is a sanction to what we've already seen. It's an amen. Now, when they laid hands upon Timothy and upon those brethren, they had noticed in them man was the gift. Remember, stir up that gift which was in you come from your grandmother Lois. And they seen this in Timothy. And therefore, the elders laid hands upon him and ordaining him, not put hands upon a man that nothing has ever been showed forth, you see. And uh, they just asked the blessings, and we all believe that. So we don't impart spiritual gifts. We only recognize them and lay hands upon them to sanction them that we believe that God has done such things for the people. Uh, notice this morning, way back in the back, Brother McKinney uh, from, uh, I believe it's Kenny or McKinney, the Methodist minister sitting back there. It's just recently been ordained here too, I believe that was right, from the platform for the whole fourth up in Ohio with Brother Dow and Sister Dow and a group from up in Ohio. Oh, when we all gather together, these little places coming together, it's wonderful. No denomination, no ties of nothing but only to Jesus Christ. That's all. Amen. Just sitting together in heavenly places. All right, sister, if you'll give us... Let's just sing this one verse of that. When the coal of fire had touched the prophet. Let's sing it together now. When the coal of fire had touched the prophet, making him as pure as pure could be, when the voice of God said, Who'll go for us? Then he answered, Am I send me? Speak, my Lord, speak, my Lord. Our brethren will come forth, if you will. Can I be quick to end? Let the other minister brothers come forth, if they will. It's going to lay hands up on my Lord. Associates of the tabernacle here. Brother Ruddle, brother them and them. And I will answer, Lord, send me. Oh, millions now in sin and shame are dying. Listen to their sad and bitter cry. Hasten, brethren, hasten to their rescue. Quickly answer, Master, here am I. Speak, my Lord. Speak, my Lord. Speak, and I'll be quick to answer thee. Speak, my Lord. Speak, my Lord. Speak. What is your name, brother? Orlando Hunt. Brother Orlando Hunt from New York City. Is that right? Brother Joseph Coleman. Joseph Coleman. Now, if you will just turn to the audience, my brother. The brother Hunt and Brother Coleman, a call of God upon their hearts. And as we have just sang the song, there's millions now in sin and shame are dying. Hallelujah. They have heard that sad and bitter cry. And we ask them, hasten, brothers, hasten to their rescue. See? Quickly answer, Master, here am I. That's where they're answering this morning. And as we, as brethren of this church and this group, sanction this by laying our hands upon them and giving them the right hand of fellowship as to be witnesses of Jesus Christ with our support here, that we will back them up in everything Amen. that's honorable and right in the gospel. Our prayers will constantly be for these men, that God will use them to honor Him. And may their ministries be rich and great in New York. Hallelujah. May their, their life be full of service for Him, Hallelujah. bringing in precious sheaves to the kingdom. 
May they live long, happy lives. May the Lord God undergird them with His everlasting presence and give to them health and strength and keep them in His service until Jesus Christ shall call them to their eternal home in the heaven of rest. Let this congregation now as we bow our heads and we ministers go forward to lay our hands upon them. Our Heavenly Father, we lay our hands upon Brother Hunt. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, as what we have known of him, Lord, has been righteous. And we thank thee for this call in his life of the ministry. Lord, speak to this brother. Win souls, bring deliverance, Lord, to those that are in captive, both sickness and and mentally and physically and spiritually. Lord, give him a real ministry that he might at the end of his road look back down through that long trail and see that he's been able by the grace of God to capture every enemy. Hallelujah. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, we ask it. Amen. Upon Brother Coleman, we also lay our hands as witnesses, Lord, to give sanction to his call that we, this church, this group of people, believe in him as a servant of Christ. And we ask that you bless him and give him a great, mighty ministry that he will win souls to the Lord and deliver the captive Thank you, and, Jesus. and break the powers of Satan Amen. around the lives of the people that he associates with. Give to him, Lord, a fruitful life. Hallelujah, and Jesus. And too, when he comes to the end of the road, God grant that he can look down a long trail hey. and see where by the grace of Jesus Christ he's been able to break ever better of the enemy to honor God. Heavenly Father, may these man now so live hey. and work in the harvest of God. May your blessings rest upon them and be with them until the time that we all gather at the feet of our great master. Amen. In Jesus Christ's name we ask that. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you, Brother Hunt. Give you a fruitful ministry. God bless you, Brother, and give you a, a fruitful ministry to you, Brother. God bless you. Amen. Again. When the coal of fire had touched the prophet, making him as pure as pure can be. When the voice of God said, Who go for us? Then he answered, Here am I, send me. Oh, speak, my... May he speak to many young hearts. Speak, my Lord. Call of God. I'll be quick to answer thee. Speak, my Lord. Speak, my Lord. Speak, and I will answer. Lord, send me. Now we thank the Lord this morning for this great honor of the church witnessing the sending out of ministers in the field in this last day. Grace of God go with you, my brethren. I hope he sends you to the foreign fields and across the world preaching this unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ. We're so needy, so needy the world is today. Now, so much of these good things, we just have to take a little here and a little there in order to get it all in the service this morning. Now, today we are, I'm speaking upon a subject that I I sometimes don't like to approach these real terrific uh, times. Now, last Sunday, if some of you wasn't here and, and didn't get the message of the third exodus, And if you like the tapes, I believe you'll enjoy that one, the third exodus. Uh, What do we got, a sick boy here or something? Oh, a little crippled boy. God bless him. All right, just the end of the service, we go pray for the sick anyhow, I see. So we, now, uh, we are, we ask you maybe if you can to get the message on the third exodus. The third time that the uh, light, the angel of the Lord that has called the people to an exodus 
has visibly showed itself on earth in an exodus. I think that's real outstanding to me. The third exodus. Would you care if I took off my coat? <laughs> hey, um, it's awfully warm in the tabernacle this morning, and the only air conditioner we have is, is what you can fan. You have to generate your own power. Right? So we are planning on someday putting a cool system in here as soon as we can get things fixed. Now, we would appreciate, if you, uh, if you like to, to hear the message, the third exodus. Now, we've had many exodus, but we can definitely put our hand on the place, time, of three exodus that God in the form of a pillar of fire has come down to call and separate people. Amen. Now, now, it's separating of people. And we find out that when he called his first exodus, he went before them in a pillar of fire and led them to, leading them to a land where later he appeared before them in a form of a man called Jesus Christ. He come from God and went to God. And uh, they, he was rejected. And he come then to call a people out of a, out of a formal uh, condition that they got into like they had down in Egypt, a giveaway to sin and to the, the ways of the Egyptians. And God called them out. And now we find the second time they give away under captivity to uh, a Roman Empire. And they got off in the creeds and got away from the real sincerity of the worship and God again sent another exodus. Uh, the, he appeared in the form of a man that led man. In the first exodus, he was a pillar of fire. Then when he came on earth in the land to where he led them, what a beautiful type it will be in the millennium where he's leading the church now. We shall see him as he is. We'll have a body like his own glorious body. And today, by the light of the gospel, reflecting from a light, a pillar of fire visibly among us, science has seen it. It's in the magazines and across the world. And it's both scientifically and spiritually recognized as the same pillar of fire by the same signs and same things that did always. Amen. And now, in the midst of days when there's a lot of fanaticism and things, yet God always identifies Himself. Now we find this, and what a glorious thing it is to know that this earthly tabernacle someday, this old frail body that we're sick and afflicted in, will be changed and made like unto his own glorious body, then we shall see him as he is and be with him in the land that we're bound for today. Amen. Oh, I'd almost make us feel like standing and singing, I'm bound for the promised land. Hallelujah. They'll probably be singing at the baptismal service anyhow, because that's our baptismal song. Now, to the brethren, both here and in the land of where the tapes go, and that's world around, uh, this message is uh, are not directed to any certain individual. And we wouldn't want people to think that we are some sort of a clan or a bunch of fanatics that's been uh, gathered ourselves together to separate ourselves, seemingly not having the faith, or separate ourselves against anybody or, or against God or against the church. We are for the church. But we're only trying to point out by the Holy Spirit and His help the reason for this segregation that we have today. We, we do not believe in it. We believe that all churches ought to be fellowshipping together, not uh, segregated away the Methodists to their group and the Baptists to theirs and the Oneness and the Trinitarians and what we have all separated out. We believe that it should be together as one great united group of the body of Jesus Christ waiting for that glorious coming. They should not be separated at all. And what separates it, there's bound to be some basic reason. 
that we're not together. In studying it, I realize in studying it, it's not the colors of our skin because yellow, black, brown, and white all separate in different organizations. It's not the kind of food we eat. We all eat the same food. We wear the same kind of clothes and so forth. But I see where basically it's at is man who's got off the beaten path of the teaching of the gospel. Amen. Each man. And there ought to be some way to definitely show which is right and wrong. And the only way you'll ever do it is not put any interpretation to the word. Just read it the way it is and believe it that way. Each man putting his only own interpretation makes it say something different. Brings it back to the original organization of the Catholic Church, which the Catholic Church believes that God is in His church and the Word has nothing to do with it. And God is in His church. And we Protestants, as we find in Revelation 17, that all of them heaped up together and that the Catholic Church was a mother of all organizations. And we see that the Protestant organization yet blindly, blindly, has the same nature of the Catholic Church. The Bible calls the Catholic Church a whore and calls the Protestant Church harlots. said that the whore was a mother of harlots. And that is people, it's an ill-famed woman who doesn't live true to her marriage vows. And we all claim to be the bride of Christ and yet so untrue. What would make the untrueness by living contrary to the the discipline that God has laid out for His bride to live by. That's my own opinion. Uh, the Bible. And it is the infallible Word of God, I believe. And uh, therefore, we find out that the Protestant church, in order to have an organization, separates itself even from the Scriptures to make its organization. The ministers ordained will hold the things that they... Now, they come to my study and in the rooms by the hundreds... And tell me, Brother Branham, you make those challenges to people. Nobody's going to stand out there against that. They know it's the truth. Well, I said, why, why don't you do it? Well, you see, if I do, I'll be begging my bread. Not, nobody, I've got a ministry. I've got to get to the Lord. And uh, I've got to get to the people. And I'll have no backing up. Do you only realize that Christ is our backing up? The Bible is our backing? See? But... It's, see, then that throws the, the Protestant church exactly the very same thing the Catholic church is. The Catholic church doesn't care. what well, I don't say I don't make it that rude to say they don't care what the Bible says. They, they believe the Bible. But, see, they got a apostolic succession is what the Catholic church is based upon. That's a succession of popes and called Peter the first pope and on down. Now, they, they believe that. They, they emphatically believe that. And the Protestant, see, they... They gather together and have an organization just exactly like they did at Nicaea, Rome, where they organized the, the Catholic Church by the, at the Nicaea Council. And we find that they're both the same. They're both the same. They leave the Word of God to make an organization. And then when it comes to many great truths that seem strange today, it's foreign to them because they've only been taught by a ritual. We have no ritual but the Bible. We have nothing but God's holy word, and that's where we stand. And now, today, I want to read some scripture, uh, just a minute, from the holy, sacred word of God, found in the book of St. Luke, the 23rd chapter of St. Luke, the base, get a, a platform of what I, I want to say, a basic a thought on the thing that I want to speak on. And uh, you're turning now to St. Luke, the 23rd uh, chapter, and I want to read one verse. That's all I need for this basis this morning to place it up on. Now, we read the, 20th, uh, the 23rd chapter, the 33rd verse of the 23rd chapter. And when they came to the place which is called Calvary... There they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Now, I want to take four words out of there, out of that reading to base what I want to say. There they crucified him. Four words. 
And I'm, my subject is called, uh, I'm a bringing an indictment uh, to the denominational churches of this day and also many of the independents for crucifying Jesus Christ afresh in this day, indicting them. This morning it's called the indictment. And I want to kind of use it more like it was like a room of a courtroom where there was, and after all, the pulpit and the church is a courtroom. The Bible said it's a judgment seat. At, at, uh, it must begin at the house of the Lord. And this is like the, the throne and the, and the jury and the witnesses and so forth. And I have today for my witness is God's Word. And my indictment is against the churches of today. Uh, I, I'm not bringing the sinner into this. I'm just speaking this to the church. And it's, it's to be in the, the uh, tapes now. And uh, I'll try to get through as quick as I can. I indict this generation for the second crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And now, to do this, in this age that we live in, uh, I do this, I must show an evidence. If I have to bring an indictment, you have to show an evidence of the criminal offense that has been done. I, I have, to indict them, I, I have to bring the, the evidence to prove it. That it is that what I'm saying will stand up before the main judge, which is, and I take myself as an attorney uh, to, on this indictment, that the Word of God being my witness, I indict this generation for the crucifixion. I must show and will show uh, that the same Spirit is on the people today that brought the first crucifixion and doing the same thing. I, I must do that if it's going to be a crucifixion that they've crucified. I must show to the, the people that the same attitude in the people today is doing the same thing spiritually that they did physically then. They crucified physically Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And now today, by the same Word, and by the, the same Holy Spirit and the same Word, I, I wish to show the churches their, their, where they stand, uh, that they are doing the same thing today, and the Bible said they would do it, and prove that this is the day that we're living in. It could not have been done a few years ago. I say 50 years ago, it could not have been done. But today, this is very timely. And it could not have been done maybe 10 years ago. But it can be done today because the, the time has run out. We are, we are at the end time. And I believe as His servant that we are, we are just about to cross from this land to another. Therefore, the time for repentance for a nation, it's gone. I believe that this nation cannot repent. I believe that it's crossed the line between mercy and judgment. I believe she's toddling in the balance. Brother Branham, before you start your case, how are you going to prove that? Just this, that we're guilty of the same sins that God destroyed the world by in the Andalusian world. We're guilty of the same sins that He destroyed the world in Sodom and Gomorrah. And now, and we got all the same spiritual evidence laying here before us. All the same spiritual evidence worldwide known that brought down the mercies of God upon those generations that also to reject brought judgment. So if this generation has rejected the same mercy that was spurned in them days, God would be unjust to let them get by without judgment. A Jack Moore, a friend of mine, once said, if this nation gets by without a punishment from God, then God would be obligated to raise up Sodom and Gomorrah and 
apologize for burning them up. Now, we know that spiritually they're doing the same thing today. For they are doing it to, for the same purpose and in the same way that they did in the crucifixion of the Lord physically. They're doing it because of jealousy, because of spiritual blindness that they don't want to see. They won't listen to it. Jesus, in his journey here on earth, he said, well, did Isaiah speak of you? You got eyes and can't see and ears and can't hear. The same reason, the same, um, the same purpose and the same reasonings. They're bringing the crucifixion of Christ anew, afresh, as we'll get to it after a while, for the same reasons that they did then. They cannot find nothing against it. They're daring to try to challenge it. And they know the evidence is there. And they know the Bible says so. And the only thing they can do is blaspheme it. Yes, exactly. So, and all this, the same reasons. And now, upon this basis, I challenge this generation of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. For a crucifying and guilty with dirty, wicked, selfish, denominational hands as crucifying the prince of life that wanted to present itself to the people. You say the same person? In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh. And manifested itself. The Word was manifested in flesh. And they condemned the flesh and put it to death. Because the Word was manifested. Hebrews 13, 8 said, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's the same Word. Amen. And for the same reason... They are trying to crucify the Word. Now, to my text, to break back upon the subject that I want to take. There, the four words. Let's explain there. There, the most holy city in the world, Jerusalem. There, the most religious city in the world. There, they, the most religious people in the world. At a religious feast, the feast of the Passover, there, the most religious spot, the most religious city, the, the greatest of all the organizations, the head of all of it, there, they, the most religious people in all the world, had gathered from all over the world, they crucified the most shameful death that could be kill, a person could be killed, naked, stripped the clothes from him, he, he despised the reproach. They, the crucifix has a, a, a rag wrapped around him, but it, they stripped his clothes from him. The most shameful, there, the greatest religious city, they, the most religious people, crucified the most shameful death, him, the most precious person. If that ain't enough to condemn this generation. There the most religious organization, the biggest of all the churches gathered together in one place. They, the most religious people of all the races, the people who are supposed to be the very worshipers of God, they gathered at the greatest holy feast they got, the cleansing of the, of the Passover, when they was brought from bondage into liberty. And there in that time, they, at that time, the most religious people in the most religious feast at the most religious place brought upon the prince of life the most shameful thing that could be done to strip a man and to hang him on a tree because cursed is he, said the law, that they worship by. Cursed is he that hangs upon a tree and he was made a curse for us. Stripping his clothes beating him and mocking him, the very God of heaven, taking his clothes from him and nailing him to a cross, him, there they crucified him under Roman capital punishment. The most shameful death today would not be shot. The most shameful death today would not be to be uh, uh, 
run over by a car and killed, drowned by water, burned by fire. But the most shameful death today is public capital punishment, where that the whole world condemns you and calls you guilty. And the whole world put their hands upon this man and called him guilty when he was innocent. And he died under the enemies, not his friends, not his laws, but under the enemy's crucifixion. The prince of life, the most precious person that there ever lived or ever will live. Jesus Christ, him the most precious person. Keep that in mind now as we build that platform around today. Could you imagine at a place like Jerusalem where for 2,500 years or more that the people, or hundreds of years, I may be a little long in that, might have been about eight or 900 years or something. I don't know just how, what the distance in time Solomon built the temple. I imagine about 800 years, something like that. And they'd look for a coming Messiah. They had gathered there for the worship of the Passover. Just think of it now. The head of all of the Pharisees, Sadducees, and what have you. One great gathering to worship God. The most holy place, Jerusalem. The temple of the Lord and the people of the Lord took the Lord Himself and crucified Him with capital punishment. Such a thing. Now, them four words, they, there, they crucified Him. Now, you know, so the Bible, you see, it's just four words, but the Bible condenses its truths. Now, me, I have to go way around and explain what I'm talking about, but the Bible don't have to explain nothing. It just is all truth. So the, 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 the Bible don't have to explain anything. It, it, it doesn't have to explain it because it is all the truth. Here is four words of its great chain of truth. I'll try to explain it, and to try to, to explain it clearly would make a library. There's no way for me to explain those four words. But now let us, by the help of him who caused it to be written, try to explain these four words, to bring it in such a way that people would understand it. What we got before us now, we got the first crucifixion <coughs> laying before us at the most holy place, the most religious people, the most shameful death to the most precious person. Oh, it's such a contradictory. My, oh, my, it's disgraceful. Now, let's take first the first word there. Let's talk on it a few minutes before we bring the indictment. We'll break this down and show you what they was doing. Then we'll find out if my indictment is correct or not. There, Jerusalem, most holy simple place because the temple was there. The most holy place because it, the temple was there and Jews from all over the world gathered to this one place, a meeting grounds uh, for worship. The most greatest place for worship that there was was at Jerusalem. The temple was there. It's, it's written, all men ought to worship at Jerusalem. All right. Because it's a center of worship. And today you hear them, one of them wants to say, they, oh, we come to these great conventions where these uh, denominations have it. And, and then we have the the opening of the, at the Vatican City and and these ordinations of popes and so forth, everybody says, we all ought to go to the campgrounds of the Methodist or the, the Bible uh, Baptist Convention or, or we all ought to go to, to uh, Rome. And there were the great center they call of Christianity. During the time of the last war, when Rome fell, these German soldiers, many of you boys know about this, them German soldiers got back up into the Vatican City there, and firing out at the Americans as they were advancing. Brother Funk and Brother Roberson and many of Brother Beeler and many of those brethren who was in that war knows. And you know what? We issued orders that they could not fire on that city. Americans, you stood there and you was a target to them. But at the West 
uh, uh, Westminster uh, Abbey at the, in England, you could fire on that all right. That's where the Protestants gathered, so it was all right to fire on that, but not to fire on the Vatican. Because as President uh, Roosevelt, I heard his speech when he, when he broadcast it that night called the Fireside Talk. He said, when Rome fell, he said, it's such a shame because... Rome is the head of all Christianity. Could you imagine a Protestant saying that? So, the great center of Christian religion. Well, we're going to, we're going to place that like Jerusalem, if you wish to. If you'd like to do that, let's put that at Jerusalem. The head of all these other, the, the, the Sanhedrins and, and of the Pharisees and of the, the Sadducees, all of them went up to Jerusalem that was really the headquarters. And in the organizational life, you've got to admit that Roman Catholic Church is the mother of all of it. Amen. She sure is. And it started from Pentecost. That's where they got to when they organized. Now, we, the Protestants, are just little sisters off of that church. And now, let's say it would be there at the Vatican today, or there at Jerusalem, as it was at that day when all men ought to come to Jerusalem to worship. Why did they do it in the days of, of Jesus? Why did they say all men should worship at Jerusalem? For there's only one place that God will fellowship with man that is under the blood of the sacrifice. That's the reason they had to come to Jerusalem. God will never meet with man nowhere else but under the blood. When you turn the blood down, then your meeting place with God has been taken away. God made His first decision in the Garden of Eden that man would only worship Him under the shed blood of the sacrifice. And that's the only place that God met with man then, and that's the only place that God ever did meet with man, and that's the only place He meets with man today is under the shed blood of the sacrifice. See? I don't care if you're a Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, if you can forget your differences, Roman Catholic, whatever you might be, and it'll come under the shed blood. God will meet with both of us there. That's where we can all meet and fellowship on the same ground. But otherwise, He will not meet just because you're a Methodist. He'll not meet just because you're Pentecostal. He'll meet with you under one condition that's under the shed blood. When your sins has been confessed and expelled in His presence, then by the blood, and the blood is always before Him, and therefore He only can see you through that shed blood, and you're white as snow. Amen. When you've confessed your sins, otherwise you're not there. You cannot fellowship. That's the reason that you don't see things happening in the churches. They confess that they believe the blood, but they reject the very plan to get to the blood. Amen. The Word. Okay? There's only one way God will honor that Word. You'll never honor that Word come and say, I'm a Roman Catholic. I demand this to be done. You can't do it. Methodist, Baptist, are Pentecostals. You can't do it. The only way you can do it is under the mercies of God through His grace is to come through the shed blood of Jesus Christ and say, Lord, I claim the promise. See? Then if you really are under that blood, God's obligated to that Word. But first, you've got to be under that blood. You see it now? No wonder they can't believe in miracles. No wonder you can't believe in the supernatural. No wonder they condemn it. The same reason they condemned it back there is the same reason they condemn it today. They're guilty as guilty can be. Because only under the shed blood. And those who dare, some little brother who dares under humility to take God at His word and walk out there and confess his sins and forget all these dogmas and things and stand there under the blood and believe it, then they want to call him a fanatic. They want to class him, on, uh, as we'd say it, it's not a good word to use at the pulpit, but uh, it's so that you'll understand he's an oddball. After all, aren't we all oddballs? See, the believer's an oddball to the unbeliever, and the unbeliever's an oddball to the believer. So who is the oddball? The farmer is an oddball to the businessman, the businessman's an oddball to the farmer. See? So who is he anyhow? I tell you, Salvation is an individual affair with man and God alone, Amen. one individual. Yes. Searching out our own salvation with fear and trembling. And I know no other basis as a teacher this morning or as a minister from Christ than to lay it down upon the Word. I cannot place it on anything else. Now, we find there then 
that only under the blood that God met the worshipers, so they met at Jerusalem. And Christ is God's provided lamb of sacrifice. And today, there's only one place that God will meet man, and that's under the blood of Jesus Christ. Anywhere else it is condemned. God will never hear it. You might do all kind of uh, emotions and all kind of isms and shake and jump and have blood and fire and smoke and everything else, but as long as that life isn't compared with the Word and God thoroughly identifying that life, then there's no need of trying it because you're out and God will never meet it till it comes under the care of that blood. Amen. That's right. So you see, in the Scripture, we've got a Jerusalem. The church has. It's in heaven. A heavenly Jerusalem where God uh, is God. And today, it's not under some creed or something that we try to make it a Jerusalem. We'd like the Methodists to like, to, like to make the, the Methodist headquarters of Jerusalem. The Catholic like to make Rome and, and the different places where we have our headquarters. We'd like to make that a, a Jerusalem. But the Bible says that our Jerusalem is from above, which is mother of all the believers. Now, and Christ is God's provided lamb. Notice how appropriate it was now, showing that that Jerusalem had, was ceasing when it was in effect until that hour. The blood of the Lamb was all right until that day. But now at the crucifixion, it changes. The old system is done. There was a new one, and the, the lamb was at the sacrifice. The lamb, the sacrificial lamb, was on the grounds. They were condemning and doing the very thing there that they had to do. It's right. God, be blessed for seeing this wonderful heavenly light in this last day because the churches is doing the same thing today. Until the hour that organization religion is condemned and proved to be sacrificing Christ's word. From then on comes the word. And the word only from the old paschal lamb passed away and Christ become our lamb. At the day of the crucifixion. And the day that the denomination crucified the word of God and accepted a creed in the stead of the word. That's the day the word come into full effect. That's just been recently. Notice. Secondly, first, there, Jerusalem. Secondly, they. They who? The Jews. The worshipers. Think of it. The worshipers themselves was killing the very one they, they claimed to be worshiping. Could you imagine such a thing as intelligent man that were priests that were trained, that had doctor's degree till it probably there they had to come out of a certain generation before they or, or tribe before they could even be a priest. They had to be Levites. Their fathers as priests, their grandfathers as priests, their great, 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 great grandfathers as priests. And they had to live such a consecrated life. To one iota against them they'd be stoned. No mercy was granted. Holy Certainly, but self-made holiness had to act like that to show their face for their church. Inside of them, Jesus said, you're full of dead man's bones. How I could bring an indictment right there. Man who know that to be the truth, this word to be the truth, and will compromise on it to show a face before some organization. I have a right to indict him. Right. Upon God's word. Notice they, the worshipers, the man who had looked for the promise, the man who had looked for it through years and ages and with nothing to do but in that constant seminary. But they had divided the word according to the teaching of the seminary. And they had missed the very truth of it. They, the priest, the ministry of that day, there, 
at their headquarters. They, the ministry of that day, was killing the very God, the very Lamb, the very One that they claimed they were worshiping, they were killing. And today I indict this bunch of ordained ministers. In their creeds and denominations, they're crucifying to the people the very God that they claim that they love and serve. I indict these ministers. In the name of the Lord Jesus, upon their doctrine, that claim that the days of miracles is past, and if the water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ is not sufficient and not right, upon any of these words that they have substituted creeds for, I indict them as guilty in the blood of Jesus Christ upon their hands for crucifying afresh the Lord Jesus a second time. They are crucifying Christ to the public. Taken from them the thing that they're supposed to be given to them, and they've substituted something else in its place. Amen. A church creed for popularity. There, they, they, the ones who ought to have known better, if anybody should have known better, it should have been their ministers. If anybody should know better, it should be the clergy of this day. If anybody ought to know the uh, the bishops and archbishops and, and ministers and doctors of divinity are to no different. But why can't they? Oh, what a contradiction. What have we got before us here but a, a contradiction? They claim that they worship God and they're killing the Prince of Life. They, there they crucified Him. And here they, again, do the same thing. For He is the Word. That's what He is, only a reflection of the Word. And that's what He is today, a reflection of the Word. Trying to find somebody to reflect Himself through. And these people keep the congregation away from God. And, and if there's anything happens and is spoke of in the congregation, they condemn it from the platform, from the pulpit, and say it's fanaticism, stay away from it. In doing so, they crucified Jesus Christ in 1963 and are just as guilty as those guys at the, uh, that day. That's an awful statement, but it's the truth. Upon that's exactly what they do today, and upon this grounds, upon the grounds of crucifying Christ upon the grounds of taking the Word and taking it away from the people is exactly what they were doing there. The very Word that God was reflecting through His own Son to prove it was, and the one that they claimed that they loved, the Jehovah that had manifested Himself by the Scriptures done exactly what He said He would do. Exactly what God said He would do. And reflected it before because the love of their church groups and things like that, they condemned the Prince of Life. And I condemn the same group today and indict them as guilty before the God by the Word of God that they're doing the same thing. This generation is indicted. Remember Hebrews 13, 8. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. How did they indict Him? Because that their creeds would not accept Him. And down in their heart, they know different. Did not Nicodemus in the third chapter of St. John well express it? Rabbi, we, the Pharisees, the preachers, the teachers, we know you're a teacher sent from God. For no man could do the things that you do unless God was with him. See? They publicly witnessed it by one of their renowned men. And stew because of their creeds, they crucified Christ. And today there's not a reader that cannot read Acts 2.38 the same as I can read it. And the rest of it is the same as I can read it. But because of their creeds and because uh, of their denominational tickets that they got in their pocket, their marks of the beast that they're packing around as fellowship cards, and taking those things, they crucify to themselves Jesus Christ afresh and crucify Him before the public and blaspheme the very God that promised to do this. Amen. 
bringing damnation upon the race. And they're there, they. Not the sinner, they. That is the church of that day. <laughs> they found fault with the man who was the Word. Is that right? They found fault with the man who was the Word. Now they find fault with the Word working through the man. <laughs> they just vice versa. Which is in the person that the Holy Spirit is working through is God's vindication. How did they know he was Christ? Because his works prove what he was. He said, which one of you can condemn me of sin? If I haven't done just exactly what the Scripture said I would do. And which, uh, somebody tell me where I fail somewhere. If I haven't showed every sign of the, that I am the Messiah, that I'm the very one that you promised it. They said, well, we have Moses. We believe Moses. said, if you would have believed Moses, you'd believe me. Yeah. If you had, uh, Moses seen my day and, and desired to, to live in this day. Moses seen the far off in the prophets. And here you are living right by it. And condemned. said, you hypocrites. said, you can discern the face of the skies, but the sign of the time you can't discern. There it is, a sign of the time. Amen. What did he class him? A fanatic. A crazy man. Yeah, they found fault with the man who was the Word. He was the Word. St. John, first chapter, proves it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word is with God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. He was the living Word of God because he was expressing God through himself. He was so completely to surrender to the, to the Word of God that he and the Word was the same. And that's exactly what the church ought to be today, that the Word of God is the same. How can you be part of that Word when you deny practically all of it? And the reason it's done is not because of people. That's the reason I think God spoke to me about calling His people the Rickies and Rickettas. It's because of these selfish denominations that's got those people living out there in the way they're living. They've crucified the truth and the people call it a blasphemy and they make it blasphemy. Rather, they call it fanaticism and so forth and not knowing that they're blaspheming the very God that they go to church to serve. Amen. Therefore, I indict this bunch of clergy today. I indict this generation. In the Amen. name of Jesus Christ, under the authority of God's Word, you are crucifying Him again. Amen. Notice, He's the same yesterday today, and forever. God's Word of vindicated in a man. Compare the two Calvaries and their acquisition. Remember, because he made himself God, we will not have this man rule over us. What was the acquisition that they could find in the council that morning uh, when they crucified Jesus? That he made himself God. He was God. And he broke the Sabbath and he was the Lord of the Sabbath. They condemned him because that he made himself God. You have no right to do this. You have no right. Our high priest, if anything is coming, come through our priest. Now compare that with the Calvary today. When God, it so pleased the Father God, the Spirit, to raise up his own Son, overshadowed the Mary by the Holy Spirit and brought forth a body that could serve him and serve his purpose to eat. It, the God was in Christ, the fullness of the Godhead bodily in Him, reflecting what God was to the people. Letting the, letting the whole world know what God wanted each individual to be, a son and daughter. He took one man and did it. And because that He didn't join with their organizational ranks, they condemned Him and crucified Him. Now compare that Calvary with the day. Because of organizational prejudice, because of indifference between scholars who ought to know God's Word and plan. Because of this, God can take a little group of people that He can work through somewhere and reflect Himself who will humble themselves to the Word. And they cannot say it isn't so. They could not say He didn't do it. For their congregation was witness of it. It was before them. They couldn't deny it. They couldn't deny His claims because the very word that they said they believed was the one who proved that He was because God took the word that was supposed to be the Messiah and showed it to a man. And they had to get rid of Him. 
It's the only way they could go on was get rid of the Messiah. And they did it through blindness and ignorance, regardless of their education. They were smart, intelligent, worldly speaking. As we compared the other night, when the light struck the rich young ruler, look what he did. He rejected a smart man. Paul, another smart man, the light struck him. What did he do? He accepted it. Amen. He forgot all he ever knew that he might know Christ. Amen. That made his life worthy of the gospel. Last Sunday night's message. There it is today. It strikes maybe some little, a man has went off, had a call of God. He felt, went to some seminary and learned some creed. He must live by that creed or give up his fellowship card. If he does, he's black marked. Nobody else will have him because once he belonged to something else and now he don't belong to it. They figure there's something wrong with that man. And they will not have him in their congregation. When the congregation are only looking for one sign, that is if he believes what they believe. If he's got a card, if he's a Methodist, if he's a card, he belongs to another fellowship or oneness or Trinitarian or whatever it might be, Church of God or in the Pentecostal ranks, all those ranks, if he packs a card, they feel that the headquarters has uh, looked him over and tested his mind and give him a psychiatrist test and see if his IQ was high enough. Then he could speak before him. If he don't, they turn him down. That's right. But you see, the congregation ought to be watching the hand of the Lord. See whether God's giving him his ordination or not. That's what we ought to be looking at. But today they crucify the, the, the Son of God afresh. When a man is able, by the grace of God, be called of God to, to let God reflect Himself through him. The works that I do shall you do also, he said. Notice. What a day that we're living in. They, they take, they, they take the, the very Calvary we can this morning and the very reason. Now, they know that was truth, but because of jealousy, prejudice, what did Jesus say to him? If I cast out devils by the finger of God, then who, who do you cast them out by? Let them be your judge. If I, by the finger of God, cast out devils, now it's like you heard him say, can you prove it's the finger of God? I'd like to, say, I'd like to heard that question asked him. They were too smart for that. <clears throat> Notice, because that he made himself God, and he was God, and we will not have him rule over us, but now the thing, the same old cry comes again. That Bible was written by man, they say. We don't have to live by that. That's God's, that's God's Word. It's God Himself. I was talking to a man yesterday. Well, some man might have wrote that Bible. I said, yes, it was. His name, we know him as God. It was written 4,000 years apart almost. The Scriptures back from Job all the way to the New Testament and wrote by, hundred, by, by and hundreds of years apart and was wrote by different men and them not knowing the other in different parts of the country and not one word of it will condemn the other. Amen. I dare anybody to come under the blood of Jesus Christ and claim any promise in there. God's obligated to take care of it. But they won't do it. They'll come say, Oh, Lord, I want to do something. Give me a great gift. Hallelujah, Lord. Glory to God. I believe I got it. Hallelujah. It'll never work. Amen. You might bring forth a lot of psychology, but it won't work. Amen. God's got to recognize that repentance. Amen. God's got to do that. Amen. We could say a lot along that line, but I hope you're, you're understanding. Look, but now they won't have the Word rule over them. I say, Every one of you return back. You're baptized wrong. You're baptized in the Catholic Church. Who are you to tell us that? It's not me. It's the Word. Amen. Well, I tell you, we, we believe. I don't care what you believe. It's what the Bible says. Amen. Well, we don't have to live by that. You do, do it, or you're under the judgment of this Bible. For whosoever shall take one word out of it or add one to it, the same will be taken out of the part of the book of life. Amen. Let him be minister, clergyman, or whoever he is. You've got to come under the rulership of this Word. Amen. For it is God. The Bible says it's God. We won't have it rule over us. They take their creeds and denominations and their the little petty things that they believe in and has been adopted by councils of man and take it instead of God's Word. What did they do? They took a Barabbas, Amen. a murderer, instead of the Son of God at the day of the first crucifixion. And today they're taking some man's Word, which is a lie and the way of death. 
in refusing to take the way of life, God's Word. Amen. I condemn this generation and died it in the Word of the Lord that they're wrong. Amen. They're guilty of crucifixion. Or trying to. Hallelujah. Crucify the Spirit. They call for a revival. Everywhere. How are you going to have a revival when the Word itself can't work to the people? Amen. I'd like for somebody to answer that for me. How can it do when you deny the very revival itself? Amen. Well, did the prophet speak of them? <laughs> forms of godliness. Their own forms back there deny the word of life. Their own forms today deny the thing that can bring them a revival. Their creeds and forms. Yes, sir. They take the denomination and their creeds instead of uh, the word. And that crucifies his word and makes his word of no effect to the people. When they see the Word of God so vividly in, in just place itself that God made the promise He would do this. And here He is doing it. And they make fun of it and get away from it. It's blasphemy. And they try to crucify the Word itself. How do they crucify it? They can't crucify the Word anymore. They can crucify God. They can crucify the body that helped God the Son of God, they could crucify that, but they can't crucify God. He had to be that time on account of being uh, the sacrifice to bring in many sons. That's predestinated to eternal life. They had to do it then, but they can't do it now. They can't do it, for the Word itself will live on. But they, what do they do? How do they form? What are you saying then, preacher? How are you building your platform here that they crucify them? They are crucifying the effects of the gospel upon the people by their creeds. Amen. That's a crucifixion. That were the public set these big morgues called churches, denominations, and draw a line of creed. And that had, the Word of God can't have an effect upon it because they, they condemn the very things that Christ said would take place. It just don't come according to their creed. And neither did Jesus come according to their understanding of Him coming. He come in the way that God sent Him. And he come exactly with the Word. No wonder he said he hid it from the eyes of the wise and prudent and revealed it to babies such as would learn. Do you understand? Oh, they have crucified the effects of the Word. i got a bunch of scriptures here. I might just quote two or three of them. They crucified. You say, how do they crucify the Word? When Jesus said that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13, 8, they say, in such a way he is. See? All right. And that Jesus said this last commandment to the church, Go ye into all the world, Mark 16. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. These signs shall follow them that believe. All the world to every creature. And it ain't half reached yet. And his millions die every year that don't ever even heard the name of Jesus. So it's still the general orders. It's still a commandment of God. All the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. If they take up serpents or drink deadly things, it shall not harm them. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. Amen. And they say that was for that generation. And they make the commandment of God of not effect to this. And they crucify the effect of the word to the people. Amen. Peter said on the day of Pentecost, with the keys to the kingdom that Jesus had just given him, whatever you say here, I'll say it up there. And on the day of Pentecost, they asked what they might do to receive the Holy Spirit if they was so enjoying it, watching it, others acting uh, what they would call uh, silly, stagger and jump and fall and act like they were drunk. And they said, these men are full of new wine. But there was a man stood up by the name of Peter who had the keys to the kingdom and said, These are not drunken. Acts 2. As you suppose, since the third hour of the day. But this is that which is spoken of. See, right back to the Word again. Amen. Showing that the Spirit is still Word. The Word is still Spirit. Yes. The Word of God. And it shall come, spoken by the prophet Joel, Joel 2.38. And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I'll pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Listen to that prophet stand there. Look at him fearless. Standing there upon that bunch and condemning them. 
indicting them. Said, this is the scripture. This is that that was spoken of by the prophet. I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. With all my hands, maids and maids, servants, I'll pour out of my spirit. I'll show signs in the heavens above and on earth, fire and pillars of smoke and vapor. Proving it by the word that it was the word. And they laughed and made fun of it. And they went to judgment and the city was burnt and they eat one another's children and today there are scattered people throughout all the world. Amen. Showing the Holy Spirit still remains the Word of God to bring this Word to make it live. Jesus Christ was the person, man, God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. He was the manifestation of God. Amen. He was God in a body form to reflect the Word of God for that age. To make that age see God's promise for that age. Amen. And the Holy Ghost is the same thing today. Amen. It's the Spirit of God upon the written Word trying to find somebody to reflect itself to this age. Yes. To prove that He's the same yesterday ever. St. John 14, 12. The works that I do shall you also. Amen. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and forever. See? Constantly trying to find its way to reflect itself. And they could not do it. The people thought so much of their denominations, their little nest that they had and so forth, called their churches, so they wouldn't listen to it. So do they do it today. Same thing, crucify afresh. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, he said, You men that dwell in Jerusalem, in Judea, hearken to my words. These are not drunk. If you'll stand still, I'll show you what it is. And he goes ahead and explains to them. One of their hearts was pricked when they heard this. So what can we do to be saved? What can we do to receive this? We're convinced that your word is right. He said, repent, every one of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, for this is to you and your children, them as far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. This is what they've got to do. Amen. Repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And today, the Roman Catholic Church adopted Father, Son, Holy Ghost. To take that's place. Instead of that, a communion. Lick out a tongue and take a wafer and a priest drink the wine and you're one together. The communion. In the stead of being the Holy Ghost called Holy Eucharist. And a Father, Son, Holy Ghost, a Trinitarian baptism was not even spoke of in the Bible. Amen. The name of Father, Son, Holy Ghost is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And when you show that to this onward generation, as Peter said, save yourself from this onward generation. Amen. When you show it to them, what do they do? Make fun of it and say, our church don't teach it that way. Amen. Then you're guilty. You're guilty of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ by taking the power of God away from the people. You crucify the very word to them and you condemn yourself with your congregation. Amen. Lead them into a death trap. As I said about that minister last Sunday, it was Martin Luther King down there with them precious people. Leading right into a death trap. Oh, somebody could only talk that man. Wish I could. Just for a little uprising of the school proposition. See, it's a lot different. My goodness, if the people ain't got hard enough to associate with a man because of his color, they're condemned and dead anyhow. Amen. The nation gives them right. Don't fight against it. Don't. What if somebody said all the Irish or somebody, all the German or somebody else had to dissociate? That would never bother Christians. They'd move right on. And that man's a Christian, is, is a minister. He shouldn't lead them people into a revolt against that. They're going to cause millions to die. It'll start another revolutionary, and it's a shame to do that. The same thing happens right here. Exactly the same thing again. That's right. See, the people, how that they'd only look at truth and see what truth is. Our church don't believe that. We got some other way. Well, it ain't the right way. It ain't the thing. He said, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Now, they won't do it. Oh, then what do they do? Now, that's just one thing. Upon hundreds, we'll get to maybe as fast as we can. Now, the second crucifixion then. If a man accepts Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, a creed in the stead of the Word titles instead of the name? What does he do to the people? He crucifies the effects of the word to the people. Amen. When he says that Mark 16 was just for that generation, and God said himself right there, Jesus talking to him, said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. 
He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them. How far? Every nation, every creed, every tongue, every race, every people. The same gospel. And these signs shall follow them that believe. And when a man tries to cut that out of the Bible, he crucifies the effects of the gospel to that congregation. So I indict you. In the name of Jesus Christ, you're guilty of murdering the Lord. The church hated him. Why? He was their very God. They hated him and denied him to be their Messiah. No, sir. They didn't want such a Messiah as that. And today, the church does the same thing. It denies the word. They don't want it. It's contradictory to what they've been taught to believe by their creeds. And the word is the Messiah. You believe that? Amen. Well, the reflection of the Word then is what? Amen. A reflecting of Messiah, Amen. which is the Holy Ghost among us. Amen. He's reflecting Himself. Try to where if He can find a lamp that He can look through, it ain't smoked up with creeds and things. Amen. He can give light through. Remember, they tr- rose and trimmed their lamps and washed out the chimneys, but it's too late. So when a man sees these Lutheran, Presbyterian, Methodists trying to come into these last days to receive the Holy Ghost, why, you know they don't get it. That's right. Oh, they might speak in tongues and jump up and down, but watch what happens. Amen. They absolutely, it's a time sign that she's over. Amen. We're at the end. Most any time, the, the church can hear the challenge to, to come on high. Amen. Amen. Just exactly setting us in order. The Holy Spirit here making Jesus Christ a reality. Through the Amen. ones that he can work through, proving himself, come down, takes his picture, shows it, makes signs, take, talk about it, everything else, proving just exactly what he said he would do, doing exactly the things he said he would do. Scripturally, not, uh, not some creed or some man's worked up idea, a lot of blood, fire, and smoke and stuff, but the scriptural, messiah evidence. Amen. Got a lot of impersonations and impersonators and, and so forth, but that only makes the real word shine its best. Amen. That's right. That's people who are spiritual who can judge between right and wrong. Denies him. Denied their Messiah. We didn't want him. The same thing they do today. Well, if I had to go down there and act like that bunch, I don't want it at all. All right, then you don't have it at all. That's all. Same now. Although he was properly identified, they didn't want him. They hated him. Why was it? We call their pastors a bunch of snakes. He said, you bunch of whited walls, you're nothing but a graveyard. The outside of his polish with robes and turned around colors, and the inside's dead man's bone. He didn't pull no punches. One little bitty Galilean, a carpenter's son. But he didn't pull no punches. He told him. Don't think John said the forerunner of him. said he was another that didn't pull any punches. He said, don't come around here saying, now you got Abraham to our father. God's able to these stones to rise children to Abraham. Yes, sir, the axe is laid to the root of the tree, and every tree that don't bring forth fruits hew down and cast into the fire. Yes, sir, God is strict and firm and stern with His Word. Yes, sir. Notice, Jesus proven by the Scripture. Do you hear me? Jesus was identified by God through the Scriptures that He was Messiah. Is that right? We get to Peter's indictment in a few minutes and you'll find out what it was. He was thoroughly identified that he was God manifested in a man called the Son of God. That's right. Although he was properly identified and vindicated the promised word that he was Messiah, Moses said this Messiah, when he comes, he'll be a prophet. And all these things will take place. The little woman with the uh, uh, stand at the well and all that dirty condition that she was. What did that symbolize? That God in these last days would pull out outcast. Yeah. Remember last night at the wedding, or the other time I preached here at the wedding supper, they said, how they said, I've made a great feast and so forth. And all these men, I bid them and each one had an excuse. I can't do it because it would ruin our creeds. Yeah. I can't come because I have a, 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 my, I've married a wife. She won't let me come. 
My, I, I got married to a church down here. My mother was Methodist or Baptist or Catholic. Or, I, I just can't stand it for that. He said, and you won't come and you won't taste my supper. But get out there and compel prostitutes and harlots and drunkards and whatever there is. Bring them in. I'll straighten them up. I made my supper and my, my guests, my table's set and it's going to be somebody there. They didn't come. It's condemning them Jews. What about today? I, I, I belong to the Presbyterian. I, I can't, I, uh, Luther, uh, I'm a oneness. I'm a two-ness. I'm a this. I can't. I can't. Oh, there you are. You won't be there then. That's exactly what he said. All right. Properly a vindicated Messiah. Properly a vindicated. The Word. The promised Word. The God that promised the Word that this is what the Messiah would be. Here he come and stood exactly. He said to him, Now, where have I failed? If you can't believe me as a man, believe the works that I do. For they are the things that tell who I am. They're the ones that says I'm Messiah. You don't want to believe me because you think of Joseph over there and I was born over there in that little hut and, and my uh, foster father here is a, a carpenter down there and, and you, when he come into Galilee there they, and was going to make, he said, here, who is this fellow? Who is this? Well, th- th- this man isn't, that, isn't Joseph and all them, his brothers here, isn't his sisters with him, isn't his mother called Mary and his daddy called Joseph? Where, where did you get a guy like that? What school did he come from? He has no fellowship card. He, he don't have any credentials. Where did a guy like that? Where'd you get this at anyhow? And the Bible said he was a, he is offended. He said many mighty works he could not do and just turned his back and walked away from him. Amen. He said a prophet's not without honor except he's among his own people. Amen. In his own county. Watch, or in his own country. There he is, properly vindicated the Messiah. Took no credit of his own. He said, I can do nothing but what I see the Father doing. And he challenged them to ask if that wasn't Messiah. And look at that little old ill-famed woman. She recognized it. She, she wasn't documented. The lamp was, she was morally wrong, of course. No one would endorse that. The laws of God condemn that. She was morally wrong, but she, see, God don't judge you uh, upon your, uh, what you are. He, enjoy, uh, he judges not how big you are, how little you are. He judges your heart, Amen. what you want to be. Amen. And she didn't want none of that stuff that went this flash before. That's what she wanted. Amen. No matter what she was then, she's ready to come. Amen. God judges the heart. Man judges the outward appearance. God looks upon the heart. No matter what she was, that light flashed and that settled it. She caught the, 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 the essence of eternal life. Oh, my, how rich this is to me. To see and know that it's the truth, I'll, I'll stand by this. I yeah, let, the God of heaven will raise up and my voice will be on the magnetic tape of God's great time. Yonder, and it will condemn this generation in the last day. Because it's on magnetic tape then to be on the eternal tape then. Trying to condemn this generation of preachers who has the form of godliness and denying the power of the Word and the manifestation was properly identified that He's still Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. I indict them by the Word of God. I have to get to another promise quickly because you only got about 15 minutes. There, they, there, they. What? Oh. Calvary. They crucified. Thirdly, they crucified him not by recognizing God's promise, word made manifest. And why did they crucify that man? Could you just imagine? Let me go back a minute. Why would them people crucify a man like that? As Mary, as I read a book one time called The Prince of the House of David, is wrote by Ingram, Dr. Ingram, wonderful book. It's a drama. It's supposed to be partly true of some old manuscript that's taken off of a woman named Adina. At her, she went over to Palestine from, from down in Egypt to uh, uh, Cairo, I believe it was, to finish her education. She was there during the time of, of Christ, and she was supposed to write back to her father. It'd be good if you picked it up and read it. it it's really good. Uh, Prince of the House of David. The same man wrote Pillar of Fire, and out of that, uh, Cecil DeMille's Tuck the Ten Commandments. Now, we find 
And in this book, this uh, Adina wrote back, and she said, on the day of the crucifixion, that Mary, Magdalene, upon whom he cast out seven devils, run out before the crowd and said, what has he done? What has he done? All he healed the sick and tried to deliver those that were in prisons. What has he done but good? Somebody said, and a man slapped her from across the yard almost and said, would you believe that silly woman before your priest? There you are. See? What had he done? He done nothing. Why did they crucify him? Why? Why? Because they didn't recognize who he was. That's the same thing today. The preachers and people of this days and our modern teachers have so indoctrinated the people to believe that this is witchcraft or the devil or a mental telepathy or some hoax or some kind of a trick until the people don't recognize that it's a vindication of God's Word for this day. Amen. It's the last day sign. The churches, if you don't belong to their organization, they'll say, oh, well, that's some makeup. That's, that's a hoax. So look down here, so and so and so and so. But let them one time prove the real thing to be a hoax. Amen. Mm. Let them one time prove that it's wrong. They can't Amen. do it. That's right. It's never been known to be wrong. Amen. And it never will be Amen. because it's God. Amen. But they like to point. They think, oh, well, if it was some a man with a great name, because it's a little group, a little bunch, it's kind of outcast. Well, we turned that person out of our church. Hey? Uh, they, they used to come to our group. See, but they went over with this and they went over with that. And now they see they wind up, well, look what it is, who it is. I don't care. They could have said the same thing about Peter, James, and John. Or an ignorant and unlearned man, they said. But they had to take notice something had happened since that time. Amen. They had been with Jesus. That's what made the difference. See? They did it because they didn't know who he was. They didn't know that the vindication of God's word wasn't standing up there. And that day. Now, it wasn't one day. Now, that was right. It wasn't one day to keep them laws and things. But the same laws that was they were to keep in point of them to a time that when he would come and be this man that he was supposed to be. They had this part but didn't take the other part. Amen. And that's the same thing they're doing now. They got a church and they believe in Jesus Christ and say they're doing things but deny the hour we're living in. Amen. Still brings the old proverb back again. Man always praising God for what he has done, looking far for what he would do and or will do and ignoring what he's doing Amen. and being condemned by it. They think God's wonderful how great He is. What He's going to do, He's going to come and be a rapture someday go home and deny the very signs and wonders right here at the time that the Scripture says that He'll be doing it. Amen. Miss the whole thing. If the blind lead the blind, Jesus said they'll all fall in the ditch. Just pray God to open our eyes in this last days. All right. Now the same. They do the same today. They deny and crucify the same God today by not knowing Him. The same by denying Him and doing by denying the things that they're doing today. They don't crucify Christ again exactly, but they blaspheme the Holy Ghost. And by doing it, they are... How do they blaspheme the Holy Ghost? How, how did they blaspheme it that back there? Why They couldn't blaspheme it then. It hadn't come yet. They called Jesus Beelzebub. Called him Beelzebub because he could know the secrets of their hearts and things. He said, this is the devil. In other words, he's a fortune teller. That's how he does this. It's by fortune telling. He's nothing but a devil. See, they hadn't had a prophet in 400 years and it done growed out of it. See? They just had their laws. They said, this is uh, Beelzebub. And Jesus said, I'll forgive you for that. But when the Holy Ghost has come, <laughs> now, you speak a word against it and it'll never be forgiven you. Remember, it will and cannot by no means, no mercy, when you blaspheme and call the Spirit of God, the Word of God that's being vindicated by the Spirit. See, the Word says so. The Spirit's are vindicating it. And you call it an unclean thing. You've crossed the line between mercy and judgment and can never be forgiven for it. That's the reason I indict this generation of guilty of crucifying, blaspheming the manifested Son of God. Amen. Amen. As is promised for all the prophets and Christ Himself to be in the last days like it was in the days of Noah and the days of Sodom. Blasphemy, which they crucified to the people, the Son of God of flesh. He is a vindicated word. One word against it can never be forgiven. Now, what are you going to do then? 
Why are you going to stand there condemned? Just waiting the hour of God's wrath to be poured out. Amen. You'll crumble. Loving doctrine of man-made denominations and dogmas better than they do the vindicated Word of God. This generation of people. Oh, I, I just wish I had a long time for this. This generation of people. This generation spurns God's revelation. But we're walking where the apostles have tried. God, you say, well, others say that too. God vindicates it. Amen. Jesus said, if, if, if the works don't speak of me, then just go ahead and say, I'm saying it myself. But the works speaks, you better believe the works. Because Amen. Mm-hmm. Amen. it's the hour. He said, you know tomorrow the sun's going to shine or it's going to be foul weather, but the sky's red and lower. And tomorrow will be fair. He said, you can discern the face of the skies, but the signs of the time you know nothing about. Amen. If you'd have known God, you'd have known my day. And they said, you take so much upon yourself, you make yourself God. And they put him on the cross. And the Holy Ghost today is not no third person. It's God himself manifested in human flesh by the blood of Jesus Christ to sanctify a life that he might reflect himself through. And they crucify that same word made manifest. You understand? The crucifixion of Christ today is the people who will deny the vindicated and manifested Son of God among the people by His things that He said would take place in this day by His Word. Now, the same vindication would have to be the same if He's the same Son of God because He said in St. John fourteen twelve now that the works that I do shall you do also. Hebrews thirteen eighty same yesterday and forever. If ye abide me, John 15, if ye abide me and my words abide in you, just ask what you will. Amen. It'll be given to you. Yes, sir. Remember, they were very religious people that did that. They wasn't outsiders. They were religious people that day. That's what's doing it today. Is the religious people. Same crucifixion, same thing today. Quickly. There, they... Crucified him then? Sure. Then they were rejecting God's Word made manifest, accepting their creeds instead of the Word. Is that what they're doing today? Exactly. Doing the same today. He was the Word, and they rejected the Word. That's one point I want you not to miss. I want you not to miss. He was the Word. And when they rejected Him, they rejected the Word. And when they did reject Him, they finally crucified Him. And that's what they've done today. Reject the Word of God and accepted their creeds and is crucified publicly before their congregation, the working of the Holy Spirit. And they're guilty. And I indict them in the name of Jesus Christ. Fifteen years I've seen him move across the land and still they hold their creeds. They're guilty. They took the word that would have brought the church, all the churches together and made a great big union brotherhood amongst Pentecostals and all the rest of them. Instead of doing so, they rejected it and turned it down made fun of it and called it everything out. And now, by a federation of church through the devil's plan trying to come in and say, now we'll come by some oil. They're rejected and they're guilty of crucifying Jesus Christ. Amen. You take it on God's terms or your terms won't work. Amen. They rejected God's Word made manifest for their creeds and they're doing the same today. He was the Word. John, St. John 1. Hebrews 13, 8 says He's the same yesterday and forever. Now they are crucifying Him afresh. Did you know the Bible said we could do that? How many would like to read just a little bit? Will you give me another 15 minutes of it? All right, let's turn over now just a minute. Uh, Crucified afresh. Let's go over to Hebrews, the sixth chapter, and read just a little bit. Hebrews, the sixth, and see if we crucify the Son of God afresh. See if it can be done. You say you can't crucify Him a second time. We find out whether we can or not. God's Word's true. Is that right? Hebrews 6, 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not into the laying of foundation of repentance and dead works, uh, 
and of faith towards God, and of doctrine of baptism laying on our hands, and of the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment, this we will do if God permits. See, Paul wants to know that these things here are absolutely essential. Baptisms, laying on our hands, resurrection, second coming, all these things are eternal. They're absolutely the truth. Now notice, for it is impossible. Read it with me, this one verse. I want you to read it with me now, the fourth verse. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted of the good word of God and the power of the world to come. If they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing that they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Is that my word here? The man who comes to a knowledge, remember, they never got it. They were borderline believers. After we have received the knowledge of the Word of God, you get it from a knowledge, from reading and seeing it, and then reject it. Then you, it's impossible for you to ever be saved. Do you read that now? See? have received a knowledge of the truth. Just you understand, you never got it. It's like them uh, believers that went out. It's a very type of the journey. This, this, uh, thir- uh, this third exodus is just a type of the rest of them. Look, look back there. Let me show you something now, just a minute. Pardon the expression. Look, Israel pulled out 12 men, one out of each tribe, denominational head, and tuck them over to the age of the border of the promised land and showed them the good things to come, what they had. And they come back complaining that we wasn't able to do it. But there was two out of the twelve. Joshua and Caleb said they looked at the word God said, it's ours, and we're more than able to take it. Is that right? What was that? Borderline believers. See, they were actually born in the church. They were heads of the people. They were bishops, as to say they walked right down to where the Word of God was shown to be the truth. There is the land. They'd never been there. They didn't know it was there. But they come down to see it was there. There it was. And Caleb and Joshua went over and brought back a, a, a bunch of grapes and let them eat some of it. And they tasted of the good land. And then went back and said, we can't do it. See? We just can't do it. Here's the same group in the time of Jesus Christ. Rabbi, we know thou art a teacher come from God. See? Borderline. We know thou art a teacher come from God. No man can do the things that you do. We're recognized that God has to be there. Why didn't they accept it? Why didn't they take it? Borderline. Borderline. Here they are on this third exodus. Same sign. Same manifestation. Same Christ, same Holy Ghost, same works, same God, same message. And they can't take it. They'd have to give up their fellowship card. What is it? He had a knowledge of the truth. They looked and seen that it's absolutely the truth. They can't deny it. The magazines have to testify they've seen it. The pictures, the papers, the evidence, the resurrection of the dead, the doctor's statements of the sick, they have to say that's him. And the predictions, not one of them ever failing down through the years, every one of them just exactly on the dock. They can't say but what it's God. But they can't accept it. That bunch of ministers in Chicago, 300 and something of them is going to come down and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Where are they at? The price is too great. They can't do it. What is it? The Bible said when they do that, what do they do? They separate themselves between mercy and judgment. For it is impossible for those that were once enlightened has been brought to look at it and had a knowledge of the truth and have tasted of the good Word of God. If they return away from it, or they'd have to renew themselves again and say, Well, now, I will, yes, you Presbyterians, you Methodists and Baptists and Lutherans, 
and this full gospel businessman stuff. Saying they're coming in. Turn away the message. Your church will... It'd be individuals in there, sure. But not the church. You have to come out of the church to get it. Okay? That's right. Individuals is all right. But when you think the Presbyterian church is going to receive the Holy Ghost and all of them take their documents down, and don't you never think that. Amen. You think you Methodists is going to do it, you'll never do it. Amen. You think you Trinitarians ever receive the name of Jesus Christ and be baptized every one of you, oh, you'll never do it. Amen. You'll never do it. But individuals will come out and do it. That's right. Amen. That's the sign of His coming. Amen. But them churches who've seen the truth and rejected it in their councils, it's impossible. Then they're guilty of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And I indict them by the Word of God. That God is... How do you indict them, Brother Branham? I indict them that God has clearly identified Himself in His Word in the last days. And made Himself to know that He's still the same yesterday, today, and forever. And they've coldly turned it down. And you're guilty of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ by blaspheming the Holy Ghost. That's right. We take you on to Hebrews 10. Again, or it tells us again in the Scriptures, not only being impossible, but you can never separate you from God eternally. You can never come in the presence of God again when you turn down the Holy Ghost and make fun of it. Now, see, if tasted of the Word. See, borderline believers. Oh, you say them guys wasn't believers? They was believers. Or professed believers. But when it come to the Word, they were Israel. They come out under the blood. They come out under the signs of Moses. They had seen those signs working. God said, I'll take you over yonder. And when they come right down to the principle of the promised Word that was to come, what did they say? Oh, we can't do it. See? And here they come back with grapes and everything to prove the Lamb was right. God's Word's right. God said, I'd give it to you, but the circumstances. My, I said we look like grasshoppers upside of us. Yeah. We can't do it no matter what. A few years ago in this old hall studio, the tabernacle, somebody come in, walked out there and talked to me. He said, Billy, you're going to preach to four posts one of these days with messages like that. I said, I'll be preaching to four posts because God's able to them posts to rise children of Abraham. That's the, that's the truth. I said, if you've got something that you can disprove it, let's have it. It's like a crow, but when it comes to a place to show it, that's different. Yes, that's what makes a difference. All right. Yeah, with their creeds, they crucify him afresh. Now, Hebrews, the sixth chapter, and we go on down. We can just read on, down, on, down, in through here. We've got plenty of time. I marked out a scripture here. Uh, where it will be uh, Hebrews, the sixth chapter. Just to, I guess take it all. Impossible for those who were once tonight and made partakers of the Holy Ghost. We haven't got time to go too far. I've got another scripture I want you to read just in a moment. Notice this. They crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh. What did they do? What? By having a taste and knowing as the truth and then turn around and denying it. Yeah. What did they do? It's impossible. So that's what this nation has done. That's what this people has done. That's what these churches has done. They've turned it down and they've crucified the message. They've crucified the truth. To the people. how they do Jesus? They put him to shame. Stripped his clothes off of him. Hung him up on a cross and nailed him up there. The prince of life. The same thing they've done today with their creeds. They've done the same thing. They stripped the things. They stripped the, the goodness and the clothing of the gospel. Amen. By trying to place it somewhere else. And hung him on a cross. Oh my. Why? There they, there they crucified. Now the last quotation. Him. Him, this most precious person. Why did they do it? They didn't know Him. Why are they doing it today? They don't know this is the truth. They're, they're dumb and blind of it. They don't know it. That's the reason. Their creeds and traditions has gotten them away from the Word of God. Amen. Now do you hear, just in closing, I'll pay close attention. See? I know it's hot. I'm hot too. <laughs> but oh, brother, this Word... It's life if you hold to it. Look, it's not something we talk about and may happen here and after. It's something that's already here with us and happening now. Not something will be something that's already. We're not testifying. We know what He has done. We know what He's going to do. But now we're telling what He is doing. This is our hour. We may not live to see the rapture. I may die today. You may die today. I don't know. But the rapture's coming. That's, that's, uh, when that comes, we'll be there. Don't worry. Mm-hmm. So all the rest of them, back through the ages, just believed it and looked for it. 
They walked in the light of their day, and here is the light. Amen. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and forever. Forsake your creeds and believe this word. This is the truth. The word is truth. Jesus said, my word or spirit, my word is life. How are you going to receive life when you reject life? How are you going to take in a dogma, which is death, and a word of life? Turn out the word of life to take death. How are you going to accept the two at the same time? You can't do it. Let every man's word be a lie, every dogma a lie. God's word's the truth. Amen. I challenge any man to show me anybody. And I know this tape goes around the world. Any man, any bishop that will come to my study or before this congregation and point their finger to one place anybody was ever baptized in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost in the New Testament. I'll show you where every person that ever was baptized and those who were baptized different had to come and be re-baptized to get the Holy Ghost. Amen. What are you going to do about it? Stay out there in your creeds? Stay out there in your dogmas and die! Your guilty, wicked hands, you've took the Prince of Life, the Word of Life, and crucified it to the people. Now, what did they do? They didn't know it. Today, men walk ignorantly. They don't know that's the truth. They think it's some kind of an ism. They don't dig down deep enough to get into the spirit of revelation. They don't pray enough. They don't call up on God enough. They just lightly take it. Oh, well, I believe it's God. Sure, the devil believes the same thing. Yes. The devil believes it more than some people claim to be. The devil believes it and trembles. Amen. People just believe it and go on. But the devil trembles knowing his judgment is coming. And people believe it and don't pay no attention to the judgment's coming. Guilty of crucifying him. Sure. I indict this generation... <laughs> Finding them guilty by the same word that found them guilty at the beginning. That's right. Jesus said, who can condemn me? He was the word made flesh. And today the same words made flesh. Peter said in his indictment in Acts, let's just read it. Peter, when he saw this taking place, what they'd done, the Spirit. Look, Peter was defending Christ. What they had done. I'm defending what the Gospels are. I, Peter was indicting them for killing the man, Christ, who was the Word. I'm indicting this generation for trying to kill the Word which is made manifest in man. Yes. Watch what Peter said. His righteous indignation must have rose up pretty highly. Listen at him. Here in Acts, the second chapter, and begin with the 22nd verse. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, approved, a man proved of God among you by miracles, signs, which God did by him in the midst, as of you, as ye yourselves also know. Whew. Imagine how they felt. Listen to that. Ye men of Israel, the prince, ye church man, you holy man, you priest, you man, as supposed to be man of God. Hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth was approved of God among you. And I say to you clergymen and to you people, Jesus of Nazareth, the Holy Ghost, He shared in the person of the Holy Ghost, Amen. which was the life that was in Him. He shared working through people and declaring Himself by signs and wonders which He does. And here they hang around on the walls scientific identification and people sitting here that was dead is a living today and cancer eating her well today blind are seeing today and cripples that are walking today Amen. Amen. Uh, the Lord. he's Jesus of Nazareth him being delivered by the determinate counsel and the foreknowledge of God predestinated for his job you have taken and by wicked hands you have slain is that, is that indictment? He's indicting what? That Sanhedrin council. Now I'm indicting this morning the Federation of Churches. I'm indicting the Pentecostals. I'm indicting the Presbyterians, the Baptists, and every denomination in the world by wicked, selfish greed. You've tucked the word of life and crucified it before the people and blasphemed it and called it fanaticism which God has raised up in our midst to prove that He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. 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 Amen.
Hallelujah. God has proved himself alive. God has proved that this is his work. What have you got but a bunch of dogma and creeds? Where can you show the living God? Because you've turned down the word of life that would give you these things. Yes, sir. Oh, what an hour that we're now living in. Same. Oh, I call. Peter said, you've took my wicked hands and have crucified and slain who God raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holy of it. And through your creeds and your organizations and your denominations with your form of godliness, your forms of godliness, you've denied the power of his resurrection. But the hour has arrived. The last days are here. When God promised, according to Malachi 4, that He would raise up in the last days and would turn the hearts of the people back to the original blessings and the Pentecostal faith of the Lord. And you can't deny it. And you can't withstand it. And then I condemn you guilty and challenge you and indict you before God that with wicked, selfish, denominational hands you crucified the Word of God before the people. And I call you guilty and ready for the judgment. Amen. Amen. Yes, sir. I call the same thing that Peter did. He called repentance of that generation. I call repentance to this generation. Repentance towards God and come back to the original truth of the Word. Come back to the faith of our fathers. Come back to the Holy Ghost because God cannot change it. When God said these signs shall follow them that believe He has to stay with that all through eternity, it's His word. When you say shake hands or take communion or something like that or some on that creed or something on that idea that any man, any drunkard, any unbeliever can do it. Any impersonator, any prostitute can do that. Take communion, have forms and things like that. You could do it. But Jesus said this will be the identification these signs shall, not they may be, they will. Amen. And all generations to them that believe, my name, they'll cast out devils, they'll speak with other tongues. Speak with new tongues and take up serpents, drink daily things, won't harm, lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. Amen. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils as freely as you receive, freely give. All this big money making schemes and things are hooked up into things today. No wonder that it's full of judgment. Yes, sir. Oh, my. Let's see now. Yes, sir. Call to repentance. My indicting now in this new Calvary is the, the church so-called most holy places, great pulpits, Catholicism, altar, Catholic altar, call their pulpit. The Methodists, the Baptists, the Presbyterian, the Lutheran, the Pentecostals, the most holy places. There he receives his hardest pierces. A new Calvary. Where is it found at? In the holy places, the church. Where is he crucified at? From the pastors. You hypocrites. You know better than that. Not angry. But something inside him is stirring. God's been thoroughly identified among you. <laughs> Where did he get his spears at in his side? Where did he get his pierces? On Calvary. Where does he get it today? In the pulpit. Where did they come from? Jerusalem. Where did they come from? The denomination. The ones who claim to love him. That's who did it. That's who does it today. His second Calvary. Where he receives his pierces against the word. That's what pierces him. Who is he? He's the word. He is the word. Where does it pierce the hardest from? The pulpit. In the holy places. Just like it was then. I've got a right to indict this generation. I've got a right to do it as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ with his signs and proving that he is God. I've got a right to bring indictment against this generation. Because his hardest spear points has been right from the pulpits 
where they criticize it and say, don't go out to hear that stuff. That's of the devil. Right in the place that's supposed to love him. And the very signs that Jesus said would take place. The Word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. The word, a discerner of the thoughts of the intents of the heart. And it's called the devil. Where from? The pulpits. The holy places. Oh, God, how can he look down? Just, just mercy, that's all, grace. We can't do nothing else but head for judgment. We're already there. <laughs> Think of it. If his hardest pierces comes from the pulpit. That's where his new Calvary's at. They crucify him, the Word, at the pulpit. That's right. How? How do they do it? By their forms of godliness. Exactly. Crowned from the audience, the scoffers. He's got a new crown of thorns. Scoffers pierced from the pulpit. Crowned by the scoffers. Is he crucified again afresh? Striped by man-made creeds. Teachers of denomination against his word. They stripe it. Shame, condemn it. Jesus said, in vain they worship me. In vain. Don't do no good. Who do they worship? They worship that same God. They was worshiping that same God at his first crucifixion. Yeah. And it was vain worship. Amen. Amen. It's the same thing today. Amen. 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 In vain they build these denominations. In vain they build these seminaries. In vain they have these creeds. Amen. Teaching for doctrine the commandments of man and denying the word of God. Amen. You're guilty of crucifying the prince of life. Teaching man's doctrines for his word. In vain they worship me. Striped. Pierced. Crowned. When you see that, go down the street and some of you ladies with long hair. Say, she's old-fashioned, isn't she? Remember! That's scoffers. That's a crown that you're wearing. God said it was your glory. Wear it with pride. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Wear it with pride. You would wear a crown of thorns for your Lord. Hallelujah. Wear it with pride. Don't be ashamed. He said, so no matter what these Jezebel says today, what these uh, uh, imposters standing in the pulpit, crucifiers of Christ, no matter what they say, you wear it with pride. Amen. God said so. You keep it. Crown with scoffers again, thorns, pierced from the pulpit with creeds. He got a new Golgotha. Where they take him to? These robe choirs. Short wearing women. Bobbed haired, painted faced. Singing in the choir like angels with talents. That's his new Golgotha. Just modern strip teases, protected by a law like it's Sodom and Gomorrah. You see a little female dog go down the street at certain times. There's not a male dog will even go out where she's at. Let a certain thing happen and every one of them will run after her. There's something happened to her. You know why? Let, watch these women take off their clothes for her and go down the street. Don't tell me it ain't the same thing. It's an identification. Don't condemn the man. But they're protected by a Sodom law. That Lord, I say it's you know, lawful for them to be out there. And preachers in the pulpit... Or to have petticoats instead of the clergy coat. Yeah. Standing out there and will permit it and ashamed to speak against it because their denomination will put them out. Yeah. You crucify to the, yeah. the yeah. congregation the word of God which says it's an abomination for a woman to wear a garment that pertains to the man. Yeah. I, I condemn the thing. I, 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 I accuse it of crucifying the Word of God before the people. Bobbed-haired women, short-wearing in the crown, stand up in the choir. Somebody said to me the other day, some woman asked me, said, well, where do you think you'd find? I said, if the Lord asked me to pick a dozen out over the world, I'd be, I'd be scared to death. 
And by the discernment of the Spirit, stand there and watch them and stand like that and see them things over the dirty, filthy, low-down cigarette suckers out there carrying home like that and stand in a robe choir and sing in that condition and let the audience see and they say, well, if she can do it, I can too. Amen. Our Christian life is a life of holiness and purity. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I invite them in the name of Jesus Christ for their filth and dirt. They have brought the gospel to a disgrace. And those who try to hold it are called fanatics. Call them that's old-fashioned nonsense. I am dying in the name of Jesus Christ. Just modern striptease is on the street. Singing choirs. Cigarette smoking. Tell dirty jokes. Three or four husbands and after the sixth one. And then singing the choir because they got a voice. You poor intellectual, spiritual deprived, rejected upon your own grounds. You read the same Bible any other man can read. But you've turned down the Spirit of God. To, the Bible said you'd be given over to a strong delusion to believe a lie and be damned by it. You actually believe that you're right. And the Bible says that you'd believe it and be damned by the same lie that you believe to be the truth. Therefore, I indict you by the Word of God. You're an teaching the people an error and crucifying the principles of Christ of holiness and life above a poor person might walk out on the street and be a different person preacher standing on ball ground smoking cigarettes stumbling blocks all the other tommy rot that they put up with women in their choir wearing shorts bobbed hair carrying on like that painted faces and then call it sister this and that. Yeah. And the Bible condemns that stuff. Amen. That's right. Go to parties and carry on. Still a member of the church. Yeah. Maintain your testimony and live any way you want to. Don't think I'm talking altogether about Presbyterians. I'm talking about you Pentecostals. Amen. That's right. You once knew the truth, but you thought you couldn't take it. You couldn't support your pastor. You, your pastor couldn't have that big job with so many hundred dollars a week in a big fine church to preach in and ride and carry on the way they do. If he condemned that, the organization would throw him out, so he has to keep it. He has to say it. Therefore, he sold his birthright for a mess of pottage of the world of Esau's slop. And what's he going to get for it? Both fall into the ditch of condemnation. And be uh, I him. As prostitutes of the gospel. Amen. I was at a choir, one of the famous big places not long ago, one of the highest ranks of Pentecost that there is. And I had to be sitting in this brother's study. One of the four or five choirs got together at, a, at a, one of the, some of the finest organizations of the Pentecostals. And they didn't know I was in this minister's study at Oklahoma. I was sitting down there below where this minister studies before he comes to his platform. And when he did there was them... Little Rickies out there and Rickettas. Paint. Not a one of them had long hair. Every one of them with bobbed hair. Every one of them with makeup on. Every one of them with robes on. And little Ricky standing around there going along like that. And another man was taking up a missionary offering. He acted like he was a blind man with a cup and going around saying all kind of blasphemy things about taking up the offering and things like that. But got out there and tried to sing the, um, the Messiah. Oh, my. He could do a pretty good job at it. But it didn't have the ring. No, it was dead, see. Oh, my. There you are. That's his new Golgotha. Why do you think it's some little girl or some little woman in there? Well, if she had come in there dressed like she should have been with long hair and paint on, off and things like that, they'd have made fun of her. If she had stood up and when he's making that to do there, that bunch of young people, about 30 or 40 of them, the selected part of Pentecost, and doing things like that, if that little lady would have said something about it, they'd have put her out of the choir. Yeah. Let the gospel preacher stand in the pulpit and say something about it. Put him out of the organization. You crucify the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. His gospel that you claim to preach, you crucify him. I indict this Christ-rejecting generation by the Word of God. And by its power of this last days of vindication that he is still alive. Yes, they are against the clean-cut, vindicated Word of God. Their organizations can't stand up to it. Big churches and denominations, this is new Calvary. I say it again. This, their modern strip teases are their choirs. 
the high priest of each denomination cries out like the high priest of that day. Now come down and show us a miracle. That was the first crucifixion. It's the same today. I've had them say, well, now you raise the dead, do you? Won't you go up there? You got a wife in the graveyard. You got a baby up there. They said to him, we heard you raise the dead. We got a graveyard full of them up here. Come raise it. Oh, ignorance will breed ignorance. <laughs> big churches, big choirs, high priests of this day. Come down. Show us a miracle. Our denomination can't do. I had a man not long ago made a remark on a, after a little broadcast I had in Jonesboro, Arkansas. Telling about some woman being healed. This fellow belonged to a certain denomination of church. And he got up behind there and said, I challenge any man to bring me and show me a miracle. I went and got a doctor, a man who had been cured with cancer. He went and got a woman who been in a wheelchair for about 20 years. She was healed of arthritis, been in a wheelchair. I took it over and said, now I want the money, $1,000. He said, well, uh, 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 it isn't here. It's over in Waco, Texas, where our headquarters is. I said, all right, we'll just go over there and get it. Said, I said, you make arrangements and we'll go tomorrow. I said, I said, we'll make, I said here's a doctor to say that these people absolutely had cancer. Here it is on the list, x-ray. Here's this woman in the whole neighborhood no, she's sat in that wheelchair for 20 years and she's walking right now and the doctor's been doctor after doctor after doctor after doctor and everything and here she is alive today. Hallelujah. Now you said you give $1,000. I want to put it in a missionary fund. I want it. He said, what's well, over at Waco, Texas? I said, we'll go tomorrow. He said, wait a minute. Let me tell you something. I'll take a little girl with me and let me take a razor and cut her arm and then you heal it before our brethren and they'll give you the money. I said, you devil. Amen. If thou be the Son of God, come off of this cross. Tell us who hits you with a rag around his head. Hit him on and say, now if you're a prophet, tell us who... If thou be the Son of God, come down off the cross. Blind, leaders of the blind. They need mental healing. A man to do a thing like that or make a remark like that. Certainly. The familiar old cry, oh, let us see you do a miracle. Master, we would desire a miracle from you whenever a day, every hour is happening right along, just as God would lead it to be yes, done. But they right. wasn't present. If they was, they t- called it Beelzebub, the devil. Yeah. Master, we'd desire if you do it the way we want you to do it. That's it. Go where we want you to go. Do what we want. Oh, yes. Uh, they had no strings on him. No, sir. That's the reason we had to get him out of their midst. <laughs> yes, sir. They're trying to do the same thing today, and through the Federation of Churches, they'll finally accomplish to do it. Amen. All I'm going to do the familiar old cry. Here we see again the most religious place. The best polished theologians calling out again and against him. Calling out the very best theologians which ought to know different. The very highest churches and best trained theologians cast him out of their midst. <coughs> they don't want it. You say, that's wrong, Brother Branham. Then you wasn't here to see the church ages. You heard it preached. He wasn't here when this lady of seeing church age was the only one that they cast him out of the church and he's out the outside knocking, trying to get back in. They cast him out because they haven't got no use for him. They crucify him afresh. Amen. How long could we go? <laughs> Remember the prophet of God's word foretold us in 2 Timothy 3, if you're writing it down. We haven't got time to read it. But said that in the last days, scoffers would come. They'd be heady, high-minded. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. False accusers, incontinent, fierce, and despisers of those that are good. Yeah. Trady, heady, high-minded, scholarly, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. From such turn away. For this is the sort that takes silly, bobbed-haired women, short-wearing, painted faces from place to place and lead them captive. Said exactly. He said, turn away from it in the last days. Let's obey the prophet. Turn away from those things in the last days. You're here. I'm calling to the church now. Yes, sir. Get away from it. They have they uh, the ministers of this day should know these things. They should have known Jesus in his days. They should have known it now they should know it. But they don't know it. Just as the Jewish teachers of his days should have known him by his day, so is it today of God's clearly a vindicated word then. He was the word. And he proved he was the word. He proved he was the word for that day. And God has proven today that he's the word of this day, the light of the hour. 
And they should have known it then, and they should know it now. They crucified him then, and they crucify him now. I indict him of it. Right. This keeps flashing through me. Indict him, because God's going to make him pay for it. The Jews of their days, God again in the days on earth. Jesus said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered you in one great big group, but you would not. How God has tried in this last days to unite His people together, but you would not. You've desired your creed. So now you're given over to destruction. That's what J- Jerusalem received. She is tore down, burned down. She's no more. And that's exactly what will be some of these days to all these big things here. Your big creeds and denominations will die and perish, but the Word of God will be eternal and live forever. His deepest wounds come from the house of so-called friends. Think. Think of it. Think of it. Stop. I'm waiting a minute. Ministers, think of it. Where did his wounds come from? The house of his so-called friends. As it was, so is it. Think of it at Calvary. He wasn't surrounded by, by savages, barbarians, but of ministers who claimed to love him. And today when the gospel is thoroughly identified, one of the great signs of His resurrection is proven among us. It isn't the street out there that jumps on you. It's the so-called ministers. Them exposed to loving is what He's surrounded by today. We'll not have that thing among us. We'll not have this man rule over us. We'll not support. We'll have no cooperation about that in this city if that thing comes this way. It's nothing but spiritualism. It's the devil. Not knowing the Word of God, the blind leading the blind, as it was then. Think, so is it now. Just as it was then, so is it now. Think, His power to heal and to set man and woman free from the love of this present world, from the bobbed-haired, painted, facey Jezebels that calls themselves Christians, and producing such a life as that. Cigarette-smoking, dirty joke-telling, Sit down and have a missionary society and stitch and sew and talk and scandal and, and get out on the street and wear shorts and everything like that and then call themselves Christians before other women. Right. You remember my story about the slave knowing he was a son of a king, his character. What ought we to be? Men and women. And deny these clergymen, these pulpits where he gets his pierces. They put up and endorse that kind of living amongst the people. Or they pierce him. They deny the power to just set him free from it. And they endorse it to be so. When it's a contrary to the word of God. For a woman to bob her hair. Or to paint her face. Or to wear shorts. It's contrary to the word of God. But they endorse it. Making another Calvary. From where? From the street? From the bar room? From the pulpit. From the pulpit. And again, what was the cry? He makes himself God. Amen. They deny his deity. They try to split him up, make three or four gods out of him. Yeah. When he is God, he Amen. was God, he'll always be God. Amen. The same yesterday, today, and forever. When you talk about one God to them, they laugh at you. We believe in a holy trinity. I believe in one holy God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes, his power to heal, to set free and take these people out of the love of the world to free them. Like he did Mary Magdalena. Remember, she was a little painted up Jezebel too. She had seven devils in her. She was a striptease. Just like the modern woman on the street today. Go anywhere you want to look. If you won't believe people bows at the shrine of naked women, look out on the street today. As it was in the days of Sodom, so shall it be. Look out if you don't believe it. Just go anywhere. Open up a paper. Open up a magazine. Look at a billboard. What do you find? You remember what it said? When the sons of God saw the daughters of man was fair, they taken unto them women. Look at the scandal in England. Look at the scandal here. Look at the whole thing's become a house of prostitution. Why is it? Why did Russia become communism? Because of vulgar and dirtiness and the non-power of the Catholic Church. 
That's exactly why this nation is taking over communism and the Federation of Churches and joining itself up with the Catholic Church, which communism and Catholicism will unite together, you know. And here they are doing it. Why? Because they have rejected the gospel that separates them and makes them a different people. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly the reason. And ministers in the pulpits putting up with it yes. for a meal ticket, yeah. for a social standing of some creed. Say, I belong to so-and-so. Swapping education for the power of God. Free them from this mad race like Mary Magdalena. The very power that could take that little strip tease on the street and make her put on clothes and act like a lady. Make a Christian out of her. They condemned that power and crucified the man that had it at Calvary. And today... The very gospel and the Holy Ghost that'll take that little strip tease and make her dress like a lady and act like a Christian. They call it fanaticism and don't want mixed among their congregation get us stirred up among them cause other women to do it. What do they do? They oust it out just like they did then. And now they crucify the very word and say it was for another age. Try and die them again. Yes, sir. It's the same as it was indicted then. The sign that made old Legion put on his clothes. Remember, a person that takes off their clothes are crazy. Amen. Yeah. How about a woman? Legion was crazy. He stripped his clothes off of him. God took his power and made him put his clothes on. He's clothed in his right mind, sitting down at the feet of Jesus. Look at the power that made old blind Barney Mayus to see. Right among their creeds. He was on the earth with just as much unbelief as there is today, but it never stopped him. He went on. He didn't pull no punches for him. He told him, you're your father, the devil. He condemned the whole thing. The power that could raise Lazarus out of the grave and gave the woman of Nain back her son. Oh, God. The power that could do those things, that could foretell the things that happened. There's two colt and a colt tied in two ways and all these things that he foretold. The very man that possessed that power away with him. We won't have him among our people. He pollutes our teachings. And they crucified Him. The very same thing today, the way with the Holy Ghost. They don't want nothing to do with it. It condemns and does these things and tells our people these things. We don't want to get mixed among our organizations. It's against our creeds. They crucify Him again. Oh, my. Notice now as we're closing, we've got to close. And again, they call it fanaticism. And they call Him a fanatic. They said He was crazy. Anybody knows that the Bible said that Jesus was... Uh, the Pharisee said, this man is a Samaritan, and he's mad. Now, what does the word mad mean? Crazy. Amen. The man's crazy. They're a bunch of crazy people. Follow him. He's Beelzebub. And again, to say the same thing, it's a sort of witchcraft. It's fortune-telling. <laughs> Placing him again on the cross of shame. What cross? What shame? Is a vindicated word, making fun of it, telling the people it's the devil, making something. Call, he said they call in the holy works of God an unclean spirit doing it. No forgiveness for it. Making shame of his word, trying to expose it and call it a fake or fanaticism. Don't go to it. Don't attend that meeting. <laughs> what do they do doing that? They take their denominational creed nails. That's right. These pleasure hunting teachers, worldly, ungodly, denominational mad, take the denominational nails and crucify the Son of God with it afresh from their pulpit. Amen. Why do they do this? They love the praises of man, the degrees that the church can give them, more than the love of the Word of God. Amen. I condemn them. They can't conform to the world because they're can't conform to the word because they're already conformed to the world. They've already uh, the hypocritical day that we live in is not this is not one Calvary enough for my Lord. Why will you do this? You that's supposed to love Him, you that knows this is His word, you can read Revelation the twenty-second chapter and say, whoever will take one word or add one word. Why do you do it? Isn't one Calvary enough for Him? I stand in his defense. I'm his attorney. And I indict you by the word of God. Change your ways or you'll go to hell. Your denominations will crumble. I indict you in the presence of the judge. Right. 
you with your forms of godliness, hypocrisies. Why do you call it in one Calvary enough? As Peter said, your denominational fathers. Peter indicted you by the, said, which of your fathers hasn't done this? Stephen's done the same thing. With wicked hands you've crucified the prince of life. Didn't Jesus say himself, which one of your fathers didn't put the prophets in the tombs? And you garnish them afterwards? So has it been through the righteous man down through the ages. So do I indict this high-polished, church-going bunch of Christ-rejecting people of this day. Mm. You with your farms of godliness crucify my Christ the second time by telling the people that these words are for some other day and it isn't for this day. I indict you, you're guilty of the same crime that they was on the day of the crucifixion. Repent and turn to God or perish. And again I say, here the churches, they the teachers, crucify by blasphemy, him the word. Amen. God be merciful. Let me say that again. It might have been mixed up on the tape. Here the churches, they the clergy, crucify by blasphemy, him the word. No wonder. It's again mid-rendering, rocks and darkening skies. My Savior bowed His head and died. But the opening veil revealed the way to heaven's joys and in its day. Amen. I say it on this tape and for this audience, I say this under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Who's on the Lord's side? Let Him come under this word. Amen. God will surely bring this wicked Christ to nine... Christ rejecting generation into judgment for blasphemy the crucifixion of His identified Word. Amen. You're Amen. coming to the judgment. I indict it. Who's on the Lord's side? Said Moses, let him come unto me. When the pillar of fire hanging there is an evidence. Hallelujah. Who's on the Lord's side? Let him take up the Word. Deny His creed. Follow Jesus Christ daily. And I'll meet you in the morning. Let's bow our heads now for a word of prayer. O oh Lord God, the giver of eternal life, the author of this word, who brought again from the dead the Lord Jesus, who properly identified it before a, a generation of unbelieving people. It's been long this morning. Many have sat here. The church is packed. People are standing around. And the tapes are being made to go out across the world into different places. Amen. Ministers will hear this in their study. I pray for them, Lord. Let these words fall deep into the heart. Cut deep. Cut away all the world. That they might say like this little... Methodist minister down in Kentucky came to me the other day and said, when I was here in those seven churches and I heard it cry out, get away from them walls of Babylon. I said, I give it up and left. I don't know which way to go or what to do, but I left. Blessed be the courage of that young man, the wife of two or three children. God made many find their way to the Word of God, the only way of life, for He is the Word. I pray for each one, Father. Sometimes in saying these things, it's not in cruelty, it's in love, because love is corrective. Hallelujah. And I pray, God, that the people understand it to be that way, that it is meant to be corrective. Hallelujah. You who had to correct them prayed for them at the cross, saying, Father, forgive them. They, they're blind. They, they just don't understand what they're doing. Hallelujah. I pray for them, ministers today, who's crucifying the Word again by taking their creeds and denominations and dogmas and substituting it for the word of life. And then before the people, they, they criticize the real truth that God is vindicating to be His truth. We pray for them, Father, that You'll call them to the marriage supper again. And may they come this time and not find excuses. For I realize the last call may have already gone. It may be too late now. I trust that it's not. 
bless this little congregation present here. These few hundred people that's gathered in here this morning. This hot day is set here for a lengthy, maybe two hours or more service. Uh, and listen. They haven't left. They sit still and listen. Many of them waiting their dinners and the women standing with their babies and they're waiting. They're holding on to every word. Lord, I realize what will happen to me at the day of the judgment if I mislead those people. I'm conscious, Lord, is conscious that I can feel that I'm trying to take them to the Word and let them live by the Word, telling them that you're the same yesterday and forever, that the great Holy Spirit is Jesus Christ, Aye. just in the form of the Holy Ghost, the same man. You said so. A little while in the world sees me no more, yet you'll see me, for I'll be with you even in you. And I know that this is you, Lord, and we believe you because we see you do the same thing among us. We yield ourselves as today soberly we do here in this congregation and on the tapes, Lord, just at this minute. May every man and woman, boy or girl hey. who's, who's here present or standing outside or here on the tape, may we at this moment make a deep consecration and yield our complete self to the service of God. Move upon the audience, Lord, in power and heal the sick. They said they had a little crippled boy sitting over here. Let that great Holy Spirit. We know just to set his presence like this, is, it'll do it. If you can go through radio and television out through the lands and heal the sick, you sent your word and heal him, you can do the same thing at this minute. I pray, God, that you'll heal every sick person, ever crippled, ever afflicted, here in, here's these words. God grant it. My prayer is for them with a, with a love of Christ in my heart and a feeling for the needy. I present them, Lord, to you upon the altar of sacrifice where the bloody body of that lamb lays. As a propitiation for our sins and sickness laying there, I plead for mercy for the people. I want to stand as Moses did in the breach for them, Lord, and say, God, be merciful for them to them a little longer and give them another chance. Don't don't do it right now, Lord. Let, let the gospel go just a little further. They're, they're condemned, Lord. I pray that your great mercy and grace will, will extend to the last person that's got their name on the book, and I know they will. It's not hard to pray against your divine word, or against, or against the, with the divine word, I mean to say, Lord, the word that's promised, the word that's been vindicated, the word that predestinated these people. Back there before the foundation word, it's not, it's not hard to, to pray that you'll save those whose names are on the book because I know you'll do it. Jesus said, so all the Father has given me will come. And no man can come unless he's been given. Now I pray, God, that everywhere these words fall, both on tape and present here, that the Holy Spirit will call every predestinated person just now from the foundation of the world when their name was put on the Lamb's book of life. May they hear the voice of God speaking today in that little still small voice down in their hearts saying, This is the way, walk in it. Grant it, Father. I ask it in Jesus' name. And while presently we have our heads bowed here in the audience, if you believe this to be truth, and you... you I've placed put my hand up on these handkerchiefs laying here and packages for the sick and the afflicted. I want to ask you a question. Sincerely now, I don't come down here just to be heard. Uh, uh, I'm tired. I'm wore out. I'm not as young as I used to be, and I, and I know our days are numbered. And I know I got to put in every little thing that I can for the kingdom of God. I got to preach every time I can get a chance. I got to, I got to go whether I feel like it or not. I come here because I... I feel to do it. I, I want to do it. I love you. And I don't say things harsh and hard to, to, because I want to. I, they, there's a pulsation inside of me. This very thing that's been vindicated is a thing that presses me to do these things. I say it kindly with love. I don't mean to scold our women or our man. I don't mean to do that, brother, sister. I only mean to bring you to a, a sharp place to where you can see the correction and the whip of the Lord, that you must come in now. Don't put it off. You might wait too long. And you who desire to come on the Lord's side with a full surrender in your heart, in the presence in the audience now, or either in the land where the tapes will be, would you with your heads bowed, don't raise your hands if you don't mean it. 
if you really mean it, you want to come to the Lord with a more consecrated life, won't you raise your hand right now? You, the Lord bless you. You're consecrating yourself anew to Christ to try to bear the reproach. Say, I'm willing today to take the reproach. I got both of my hands up too. I, I want to take the reproach of Jesus Christ upon me. I gladly wear this mark called Holy Roller, whatever you might want to call it. I wear it with pride because it's for the Lord's sake. I wear it with pride. Don't you all want to do the same? Raise your hands and say, by the grace of God, I, I, I want... I'm, the disciples returned, thought it was a great honor to bear the reproach of His name. Or you want to bear the reproach of some Hollywood star, some television, something, or some church member or something, or do you want the reproach of the Word of Jesus Christ? Give me the reproach of the Word, Lord. I know He bore the reproach of God's Word. Let me bear it too, Lord. And this consecrated cross I'll bear till death shall set me free. Then go home a crown to wear. There will be a crown someday for us. It's being made now. When this earthly life is run, then we know that it'll be right. Now, there's no room to bring people around an altar. Let your seat where you're at be an altar, as many as believe, while we pray. Heavenly Father, it looked to me like that most every hand of young and old was up in this audience. I pray that every time that the tape will be played, that the people will put their hands up and kneel down in the room. Father and mother, go over and get a hold of each other's hands and say, Honey, we've been church members long enough. Let's come to Christ. Grant it, Lord. Bless these people here. I pray that you'll give them, Lord, a consecrated life. Many of them, Lord, are good people. They're, they're your people. They just have no truth. And I pray that you'll show them thy truth, Lord. Thy word is truth. As you said in John, I think about the 17th chapter, you said, Sanctify them, Father, through the truth. Thy word is truth. And it, again, thy word is still truth. It always is truth because it's God. And I pray, God, that you'll sanctify them through the truth. That is, sanctify, purify them from all creeds and denominations. Cre purify them from all worldly things to a consecrated life of the Word. Grant it, Lord. They're yours now. You promised to do it. And as your servant, I offer my prayer in their behalf. In the name of Jesus Christ. Now, with our heads bowed. Let's sing this hymn while we continue praying. Jesus paid all, all to Him. Think of it. Sin and Yesterday I was in a, a place and a man was measuring me for a suit that a brother here in a church bought me. He said, your suit looked hot and I bought you a cool one. And I went over to get it cut. And he said, say, your right shoulder's drooping down. You must have carried a heavy load someday. And I thought, yes, a load of sin. But Jesus... Paid it all. Listen as we sing it. Jesus paid all. Then all, all my life to Him I. What had sin done? Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white. God, be merciful to us as this deep time of meditation. Let the Word soak in deep, Lord, to the heart. Let the people, though they be late for their dinner, but, Lord, this is more than meat. This is life. My Word is meat, you said. And that's what our hungry souls are feasting on. Now take us, Lord. Mold us. Lord, take me with them. I want to go with them. I'm going up to Calvary now, Lord, by faith. I'm going with this congregation. Now just mold me over, Lord. I did wrong. Many times, I hear recently I was going to 
just quit preaching, the people wouldn't hear me. He just kept on doing the same thing, and I, I got discouraged. I built a complex. Oh, God. A couple Sundays ago, when you give me that sign out there and, not, and reading a Bible, and see, you told Moses, just as that dream was, that there was a mountain to it, would be a sign to him. And then right at the end of it, to know that I'd, I'd left a lot of sick people, a ministry not only in the prophetic, but in teaching the Word and, and for he, praying for the sick, you let a man drop dead right here on the floor. Then brought him back to life for confirmation that it was true. You always confirm your Word. Now, Lord, confirm it right now while I'm before your throne. Take every one of these people, Lord. Take the world out of us. Take me, Lord, while we're in your presence. Just take the word. Ring our hearts, God, right now. Pull the world and the care of the world away from us. Let us be consecrated Christians. Oh, God, to be loving and kind and sweet, bearing the fruit of the Spirit. Won't you, Lord, we're before your throne. Sin has left a crimson stain on every one of us, but your blood can remit it, Lord, and make it white as snow. Grant it while we're waiting upon the... Take us. We are yours. Consecrated our lives to you. In Jesus Christ's name. Grant it, Lord, to each one of us. Ring my heart, Lord. I see all my errors. I see my mistakes. God, from this time, I'm trying to live the best that I can to help you. I want to go. I want to consecrate my life anew to you across here this morning. After bringing this indictment against my, my clergymen friends out there. And have to say these hard things. But Lord, I did it by your inspiration. I feel that you told me to do it. That's off my shoulders, Lord. I, I'm glad that it's off. Let them do with it whatever they will, Father. I pray that they'll accept it. I pray that you'll save everyone, Lord. May there come forth a revival of the just. And a great power come among the church. Just before it's going. It's not hard to pray that because you promised it. And we're looking, Lord, for that third pull that we know that will do great things for us in our midst. I am yours, Lord. I lay myself on this altar just as consecrated as I know how to make myself. Take the world from me, Lord. Take the things from me that's perishable. Give me the imperishable things, the Word of God. May I be able to live that Word so closely till the Word will be in me and I in the Word. Grant it, Lord. May I never turn from it. May I hold that King's sword so tightly and grip it so closely. Grant it, Lord. Bless us together. We're your servants. As we consecrate ourselves to you this morning, afresh in our hearts, we are yours in the name of Jesus Christ for service. Jesus. God bless you. Brother Neville.